I'd like to call to order uh, a joint meeting of the Planning Commission and Landmark Preservation Board for the City of Bothell. Tonight is Wednesday, November 20th, 2019 at 6 p.m. All Planning Commissioners are present with the exceptions of Commissioner Pystrip, who's absent and excused, as well as Commissioner Cabe, who probably will be joining us uh, shortly. And let's see, with, without that, uh, and then I would also like to uh, welcome the Landmark Preservation Board. I'm gonna turn it over now to Carrie. I'm Carrie Westerbeck, and uh, all uh, we have uh, five members of the Landmark Preservation Board tonight. Uh, absent only uh, is Vicki Sampi, who we expect to be here soon. And uh, we have one member leaving early, but we'll still maintain a quorum. And the purpose of tonight is uh, Landmark Preservation Board to present uh, changes to Title 22 to Planning Commission, since you have purview over uh, the, I guess we'd say land use code, and, uh, and get your uh, thoughts and input on that before we recommend uh, changes to that um, developed by staff. So with that, uh, we can move on to Part three. Part three. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you, Carrie. Yep. Um, uh, this is time for public comments for anything not related to uh, what's um, with regards to the hearing tonight or the study session. And uh, there's nobody signed up, nobody here. So with that, we will go ahead and just move into the joint study session. And um, we will be led for the first part of the study session by uh, Sarah Desimone and Mike Catterman. And uh, this is a study session, so we don't necessarily need to call on people here, but let's maybe try not to talk over each other. But since it's a study session, we'll just uh, hopefully it just flows along real nice. So uh, with that, I hope I'll hand it over to uh, Michael Catterman, Community Economic Development Director for the City of Bothell. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very happy to see everyone here tonight in this joint meeting of the, the board and the commission. This is a... Uh, uh, always fun and interesting when we do joint meetings like this. So we've got some, uh, I think we've got some really good items on the agenda for you this evening. So Sarah and I are going to cover this first item, which has to do with the Title 22 Code Amendments. Um, and I'll let Sarah give you a little bit more background on it. But the, the main purpose, as um, Chair Westerbeck mentioned, was for, this is the opportunity primarily for the Planning Commission to provide comments that then the, the Landmark Preservation Board can uh, can use and incorporate into your recommendation to the City Council. Uh, uh, as you may or may not recall, we've recently made some changes to the, the code that sets up certain consultation requirements uh, as well as review requirements for different elements of the comprehensive plan as well as different titles in the uh, Bothell Municipal Code. Title 22 is under the purview of the Landmark Preservation Board, so you make the recommendation to the City Council. Uh, but the language that was added recently was that you would consult with the Planning Commission on that because there are some things that overlap a little bit with, with land use portions. Uh, as you know, there are some things that maybe go through the, the land use review process where the Landmark Board is involved, other places where you're not necessarily involved. But all of those land use code amendments go through the Planning Commission. So we thought this was a good opportunity to, to bring that to you. Um, I will say that we have provided in your packet, we have provided under attachment one of this first item, the existing code with track changes. Uh, we've provided the entire thing for the Planning Commission just as background. We're not going to go through the entire code because it doesn't all pertain to the Planning Commission's role in this. Really our focus this evening with the Planning Commission is on pages, uh, page 20 of 41 in attachment one. And it's uh, sections 2224-030 and 2224-040. So that's really the, the, the main purpose of tonight's meeting. But we can certainly answer questions. Uh, you know, if there are other things that are important for context or understanding, we're happy to go there as well. Uh, and as I said, this is the, the, the opportunity for the Planning Commission to provide comments. But that's not to say that the, the Landmark Board can't also participate in this. We would encourage you to if you have certain perspectives you think are important for the commission to understand, or if you need some clarification on things. Um, I, I will say for the benefit of the commission, we have gone through this with the Landmark Board once already, and they will be considering this at their next meeting for recommendation next Tuesday. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah to kind of walk us through some of the background on this and, and what we're looking for this evening. All right, thank you, Director Cotterman. 
So as you probably know, the Title 22 is the city's landmark ordinance. Um, so the purpose is to provide for the identification, enhancement, perpetuation, and use of historic resources within, within the city. Um, and within that code, it sets up the foundation for the Landmark Preservation Board and, and um, what their duties are. Um, and part of that is to maintain an inventory of historic resources, which is just basically a big list of things that are approximately 50 years old and older. Um, and they also established the Bothell Register of Historic Landmarks, which is a little bit different than the historic inventory. It is a list of properties that are very um, important to the city in some way. Um, and then the owners have to actually sign up for that and they um, have to sign a contract that they will keep the property in, in its original condition and, and stuff like that. Um, so several years ago, um, quite a few years ago, I believe, uh, they added some language for the historic districts. So what a historic district is, um, it's just instead of one property being listed by itself for its own significance, it's a group of properties that are listed because they relate um, in some way and they have a historic significance that's derived from the group as opposed to just themselves. Um, districts can be either large or small in terms of both the number of resources and the geographic area. You could have um, like an entire downtown that is a historic district with tons of buildings, or you could have just one property with say six buildings and you know a water feature and a garden and a whatever else that's listed on there. And that can also be a historic district. Um, so in order to establish a historic district, there's a, a petition involved where you need to get consent from a certain majority of the, the property owners. Um, and at that point, they are bound by some design guidelines that have also been kind of put in place with that district. So a few years ago, probably almost five years ago now, there was a small district that um, the owners all wanted to have their property in this district. Um, and they brought it before the landmark board. But at the last minute, one of the property owners changed their mind. And at that point, we realized after going through the code that it was just not quite strong enough to be able to put a district in place without having 100% owner approval. So at that point, the landmark board asked us to kind of go over the Title 22 and try and make it so that it would be a little more um, feasible as far as actually creating a historic district. Um, so, you know, enter 2019. Here we are finally getting around to getting this all, all put together. Um, so as Director Cotterman was saying, the we did quite a bit of um, amendments to the code, but what you guys are actually going to talk about tonight is just one little section. So with that, I will turn it over to Director Cotterman again. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so on page 20, uh, looking at 22, 24, 030, and 040, the, the change here has to do with um, part of the designation process really for districts. And this is where the Planning Commission would be involved in the designation process. The, as, as Sarah was talking about, the process itself through the petition and all of that would go through the Landmark Preservation Board and they would arrive at a recommendation that would go to the council. Uh, we spent some time talking in staff about this and then um, proposing to the, the Landmark Board that before it goes to the council, we should have a set of um, design standards in place for that historic district because that is part of what is necessary to ensure that preservation. We went back and forth about whether to do that before the recommendation goes to the council or after the recommendation goes to the council. The staff really felt that it was important to make sure that that gets done before the council takes final action on the district so that we don't have a district in place with no design standards because it could take a while for that to develop. So the way that we would envision this happening would be for when the, when the board is considering a designation for a district, you would also be identifying what those standards should be. Um, you know, what, what's the era of the architecture, for example? What are some of the architectural features that should be part of those design standards? So we're not asking you to draft them, but certainly to provide a, a pretty good outline for what the staff would then develop as design standards and guidelines for the, the Planning Commission to then consider and recommend to the, to the council. And then that entire package with the landmark board's res uh, excuse me, recommendation to the district as well as those design standards would go to the council as a complete package. 
so they could act on that at one time. That could take a little bit of time. Um, because that is an amendment to um, Title 12, which is the zoning code, that, um, that goes through the Planning Commission under our Botham Municipal Code. But it also re uh, provides for consultation with the Landmark Board when appropriate. So we see that process as providing that consultation as well. Now for an, a larger district or something that's a little bit more uh, complex, the downtown, for example, we may actually do a joint meeting to work through some of those particular items. We have that option. You know, there are different ways that we can do that consultation. So that's the way that we've laid it out. I think the, the sequencing is really one of the things that we wanted to make sure that the board and commission are, are comfortable with how we're approaching that um, and that we've got everything in here that you think is necessary for each body to do in terms of, of arriving at that full package that can go to the council. Is that... Is there anything else you want to add to that, Sarah? No, I think that, I think that covers it. Are there any questions about that? Yes, for closer. So this would assume that you're looking for consistency of uh, design within a district. I yes, I think in in general, uh, okay. it may not be. Um, consistency across the board because there are some properties that are contributing properties, other that are non-contributing properties. So there may the standards may apply differently. I'm not sure exactly how that would work. Sarah, maybe you could talk some more to that. And that was actually what I was wondering, how the non-contributing properties mm -hmm. would then be affected by the design standards within the newly designated district. Right. Um, so in a district, there's going to be, like you said, some that contribute and some that don't. Um, ideally, you're going to have a large concentration of contributing properties, which is why you draw the boundaries where you do is because they're kind of all grouped in one area. Um, it, the purpose of a district, though, is to actually preserve that entire area, including the ones that are non-contributing. So the people that are non-contributing would also be bound by the design standards. And the same with new construction in the area. But I could also envision a situation, tell me if I'm wrong, where the design standards may have, in some instances, there may be two, um, two different standards, one for the contributing properties and the other for the non-contributing properties. Generally not the case, okay. um, but it is, sort of, it is sort of geared so that it's not going to make you know, a non-contributing property do something completely crazy or, or really expensive or just not feasible. Um, and even the non-contributing properties generally are going to be somewhat similar to what's in the district already. Um, and it really is case by case. So you could, I've never seen it, but I think you could do something that's, you know, different for the, for the mm -hmm. non-contributing properties. That could be something we work out. Um, but I haven't seen it. Okay. I have a question that we might have covered our, our meeting looking at all this last month. And I hope this isn't a dumb question, but I'm ca I'm not clear on whether each. It seems like with each historic district, we would have we this discussion would happen about the design elements for yes. that specific district, and yes. then another one would have another discussion and another set. Okay, I want to make sure that yeah, we yeah, each sort district of, will have. Right, it would be way too generic yeah. otherwise. Okay, yes, I want to make sure. Exactly. Yeah. That's correct, and for the for the reasons that you cited, so they're they're going to be different. They're going to have different needs different requirements. Makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Clarifying. Is there, a, is there a minimum number for, for making a district? No, I mean, it's just structures. multiple. Sorry. Multiple is all it says. So, you know, it could be two, it could be five, it could be 300. Uh, okay. And a little more for that same question. Um, for each, design, each historic district, do we write up into the ordinances the, the particular special features for that district within the code, or is it kept someplace on file so people, I mean, how do they understand what they can and can't do? Do we codify that somehow? Okay. Yes, we will. Most, mostly it's a housekeeping nuts and bolts question, sorry. No, no, mm -hmm. that's, and that'll be part of, I think, planning commission's role too, is to help figure out, you know, where to put that. Okay. Um, and how to implement that. But yeah, it, uh, generally you'll have kind of an outline in your document that says this is kind of the overall goal here and okay. these are the features and this is why and and that goes in with the okay with the standards 
Because I know we talked about it. I was like, well, where do we record these and where people go find them and re research them? And so thanks. And I think one way to look at this is it's a it's a finer level of of detail in terms of the standards that would apply to those particular properties. So, for example, we have design standards now in the code for different you know different sub areas of the city. In some cases, they have different design standards. We have design standards for the downtown, some of which relate to. Um, the historic nature character of downtown, and we're going to talk about that tonight as well. But if we have a district, then we're we're going to a finer a, right. a finer level of detail, and that would be either in the code or in a design manual that would be referenced in the code that would still apply. But it, and then taking that a step further, because it would be in that historic district. If there is something proposed in that district, then it would go through our design process, design review process in the city. But it would also then have some um, review by the landmark board. Sure. Mm -hmm. Which we're used to. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a question about um, maybe overlap of districts. So in certain circumstances, we have special design districts throughout the community. Um, let's just say in a downtown area, we have a special design district. If a <coughs> historic district was created in such a way that it overlaps between an area that does have a design district, it's a design district, but also outside of that area or in a different design district, how would the hierarchy of different um, design priorities be decided? Great question. And that's where the Planning Commission comes in. Because as, as you're looking at those design standards, we would be identifying which ones may conflict or may, you know, complement. Uh, so it would be up to the commission then as part of your recommendation to the council to say, these are the items where we think the, the design guidelines for the historic district prevail over whatever the underlying standards might be. Or you may say those standards are fine <clears throat> for the underlying district, so we don't need to address those. Or they may apply in certain circumstances, but not others. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So let's just, um, maybe we can, uh, oh, okay, Kevin. Yeah. Another quick question. Um, elsewhere in the packet, there makes reference to different uh, architectural styles of significance. Um, is it possible or likely that within a district, you might have two distinct styles, buildings of two distinct styles, and then how would you work your standards around that with an okay. interest in preserving both? Right. Yeah, district is usually going to have many different styles in it. Um, and kind of the way it works, generally speaking, is there'll be a section for each style that says this is what is appropriate for the style and, you know, whatever else you want to include in there. There'll be a section for, say, streetscapes or landscaping if it's needed. Um, just to, it really is all tailored to the district. So it could it could be kind of any number of things. Mm -hmm. And depending on how how those are arranged within that district, you know, if it's, a, if it's an entire street frontage, then the standards may refer to that particular street frontage. If it's individual properties, then it may call out individual properties as well. Yeah, and I know, um, I don't know if this is particularly the, the, the right part for it, but I know we were in the meeting yesterday and Kara, you brought up the idea of like incentivizing, so that's a potential that maybe the, the commission wants to think about with regards to people who I want to be contributing um, is ways for the city or for us to put into the code ways to incentivize people to either retain their current structure or make it not necessarily, yeah, mm -hmm. basically to choose to keep the structure in place uh, even though the, uh, the well, I don't know if the underlying zoning would change, I guess it would, but um, you could, like, it could technically be, currently be a residential home, but could be a restaurant or something like that, or a coffee shop or something like that in the future. So that the actual designation could change. Yes, and that, um, that wouldn't necessarily work into the, the design standards, because that's really more the regulatory piece of it. The incentives, I think, are, are certainly another important component to, to consider, and I would, um, I'd ask that we, we defer that to the, the item that Dave and Sarah are going to talk about in you know, a little bit later on the agenda. Okay, sorry about jumping the gun on that. No, nope, that's okay. It it all it all plays together. So, so I know Michael, you wanted us to to concentrate specific mostly. I mean, the the meat of it, I believe, in your mind, is on 
pages 20 and 21. So oh, and we, it looks like we have it up here on the screen. So if, if there's anybody on the commission or the board who would like to comment on on what's up there, or anything they'd like to see changed or added, mm -hmm. this would be a good time to do it. Or other questions or, or comments right. about any other aspect of this? Uh, Sarah, you emailed us to today, yesterday, with someone to send an email with some public comments who couldn't be here. Would you mind running through the gist of what his concerns were with the non-contributing properties? Um, it doesn't really apply to this. I don't know if we want to. Oh, it doesn't? It doesn't. Oh, okay. Not to the yeah. land use portion. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, but we can discuss that at the at the landmark board meeting. It'll be on your. It'll be something you'll take into account. Cool. I do have another question specifically for the planning commission for this. If if you, there are no other questions or comments about the content, um, suddenly I'm echoing. <laughs> And that's about the format of how this is presented. We asked this of the Landmark Board as well. We tried a little different approach to how we present code changes. So we have the two-column format here. Um, for the Planning Commission, this isn't how we've done it with you in the past, but it's something we wanted to test out to see if, <clears throat> if this is um, easier for you to, to understand what's changing and why. So we provide the track changes in the existing code on the left-hand column, and then we provide some explanatory comments in the right-hand column. So just from the Planning Commission, if, if you have, if you like it, if you don't like it, if you're indifferent, I'm just kind of curious. I like it. I also think it's a good addition. Thank you. It is quite helpful. Okay. And I'm hearing nods from at least one of the other two, so <laughs> thank you. So with, yeah, so with regards to what you want from the commission, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I like what is proposed here, and I guess we'll see here from other commissioners, I would assume, oh, Commissioner Hampton. Yeah, I have a question about the, the, the so if this change is made and the design guidelines are adopted in, in a certain area, and, and I'm not to bring up a lightning rod, but if I brought up Country Village, for example, had they gone through this process and put together some design guidelines, and then the property owner wanted to completely redevelop the property mm -hmm. as they're doing, would they be bound by those design guidelines? Do they follow the property in perpetuity, or is there a mechanism for them to change that in the future? Maybe just a little bit about that would be good. I think that's a good question. Um, and. Sarah can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong on this. I think the way it would work is if there's a, a district that's established and at some point the property owners decide they don't want the district anymore, there's a process for that to be de-designated. Yes. In, in, that, in that process then we would also then repeal those design guidelines because they really wouldn't be relevant to what might develop there in the future. That would be my expectation, you know, depending on what's, depending on the circumstance, if they're proposing something that is trying to replicate some historic era, then we might look at it and say, well, then we should keep some of these design guidelines in place or not. But I think for the most part, what we would experience is if the designation itself is going away, then those design standards would also go away because they probably wouldn't be relevant to, to what's happening after that. So two, two follow-up questions. What would that elimination of the designation look like? Would, would it be a public process, or is it an application to your department, and it just happens, or does it have to go to council and commission and landmark preservation? It goes to council for the final decision, and I can't remember. I've never actually had it happen. Um, I would have to look up, actually, to figure out what the process is, but it is council decision. And I don't know if that means they can say, no, this is something that you agreed to and it's staying. I, it's my understanding that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the, the follow-up question, you just kind of led me there, is if it's a new property owner that didn't petition for it, for example, there was maybe a block near downtown and there was some historically significant homes there 
and all of the property owners decided that they wanted to do this. If enough of those houses were sold and new property owners came in and whatever the, the margin is, they, they had the votes or they wouldn't have the votes if they'd done it again, would they build a petition to get out of that? Petition, yes. Yeah. Uh, but the idea is that a historic district provides some public benefit, and so it's really going to be up to the council to decide, you know, is the benefit of letting them have their, you know, new buildings or whatever they want outweighing the benefit to the public. So, so, so I think the answer to your, your question is that, yes, there is a process. They could, they could petition for that. It, the council could then decide whether or not they wanted to uh, repeal the designation. Uh, and there would be a, I'm sure, it, it would be a public process, certainly, because it's going through the council. Uh, I would expect, I don't recall either how it's written in here, but I would expect that uh, we would probably take that through the landmark board as well because they were part of the original process. So it, 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 you're unringing the bell, mm -hmm. which I know is not possible, but you're, you're, you're going back through that same process. Yeah, so something to the effect of it will go through the same process for removal. So you basically just go to Landmark Board and then mm -hmm. to the council. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. There's a letter being passed around right now. I think it's, pr like you mentioned earlier, this is primarily for uh, the landmark board for their meeting, right? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But it's it's a, it's a good background. It's on. good information for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. This, this is really pertaining more to the other sections of the code of of this title. So right, uh, I'm, uh, uh, right now, are we discussing primarily? Um, and, and congratulations to the city for getting the grant to proceed with kind of. Uh, doing this process on going through and looking into a, a district downtown. Um, are, we, what we're, are we primarily tonight talking just about downtown or are we talking throughout the city? I, I know some, there are some comments um, in here about potentially outside of the downtown. So there, there are really three items on your agenda this evening for the joint meeting. The, this is the first one, and it's really just about the Title 22 amendments as they pertain to the Planning Commission. So, in, in, and we can move on from that at any point. We're not asking for any formal action by the Planning Commission. We really just wanted to get your feedback, give you a chance to, to look at this, ask questions, and, and let us know if there's something else that you wanted us to, to look at or change in here. Um, and I'm not, I'm not getting that sense. So if the Commission... You know, if, if you're comfortable with what's proposed in terms of the language, um, then we can go on to the next items here, which have to do with, um, it really is more about the downtown, and it has to do with the historic resources inventory that um, Sarah's been working on, as well as some code amendments that, um, that Dave has been working on. And to be clear, staff was kind of working in conjunction with the landmark board with this previously, right? With Title 22? Yes. Yes. Got it. Yes. I mean, that is We've, yeah. basically what you all do, so. Okay. Right. And, and they'll, like I said, they'll be making their recommendation. Um, you've got a meeting next Tuesday, I believe. So that'll be, um, we anticipate uh, a recommendation coming out of the board at that point, which will then go to the council. At this time, I don't have a date for the council, when it would go to the council. Okay. This is uh, Karsten. I have a, a comment on um, page 22 of the attachment one um, in proposed amendment for section 22.24.050. Um, I see that the time was lengthened uh, between recommendation and presentation to council on account of uh, planning commission review. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that um, this process is working towards expediency where, wherever possible. And I'm just wondering if I could have clarification on, um, on the, the language at the beginning of Section A, the Council should act on the recommendation of the Board within 120 days of recommendation. Um, so between recommendation of the Board and Council action, what is the expectation of planning commission in in engaging with I mean wouldn't planning commission also be a part of the presentation to council yes and that would come before the 120 days so the the development of those design standards that would be part of the recommendation from the board would be developed before they send the recommendation to the council 
So the, the and, and we're not bound by the 120 day clock. We weren't really bound by the 30 day clock either. But I think staff was looking at that and saying just, just in terms of getting on the council agenda and preparing all the agenda memos and attachments, 30 days is not enough time. So that's why the 120 days. So it's, it's to give us some guidance. Thank you, Phil. Uh, to give staff some guidance that, you know, we, we do need to try to make sure that we get this moving forward once we have the recommendation from the board. So there's an expectation that's created um, so that it doesn't just languish, you know, and we get to it when we get to it. But it, it, we felt it was important at least to have something in there that, that gave the staff some direction to put this on the council agenda as, as soon as we could within that period. Understood. Does that answer your question does, about yeah. the, the role of commissioner? Yes, thanks. And I'm assuming you'll tell me if I'm wrong in any of this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, I, I guess it looks I'm looking around and I'm not seeing any more questions with regards to it. Is that a so I guess um, I guess that means that with regards to other, any other questions, the the um, what, one more quick question. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, absolutely, I, Jason, for sure. I think I figured it out, but I just want to ask for clarification. This is Jason Hampton. Uh, under the requirements of designation for a property owner who petitions, it says upon the approval of the city council, <clears throat> and then for a district, it says upon adoption by city council. Is there a reason that the language is different? Approval or adoption? I believe it's because, uh, that's a good question, and I'll, we'll double check that, but I, I think it's because for an individual property, there's it's a contract. Council doesn't adopt a contract, they approve a contract. For an, an historic district, it's a designation, and it's a, and there are code amendments that go with it, so it would be part of an ordinance that they would adopt. I believe that's why the, the difference. That's it's what my thought was as well, but can you clarify whether both would require a majority vote from council? Anything requires a okay, majority perfect. vote from council All right. that's, that's to be question. approved, yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay if there's no other question. Item. Okay, great. And so I will go ahead and... Uh, Go ahead and hand it back over to Carrie Westerbeck with the Landmark Preservation Board for the second part. Thanks, David. This is Carrie Westerbeck, Chair of Landmark's Board, speaking. Um, we'll now move on to um, uh, Sarah Desimone to talk to us about the um, historic resources inventory and uh, the work she's doing based on um, our downtown from a grant to uh, research the historic resources in downtown. With that, I think I can turn it over. Ready, Sarah? Okay. Yes. All right, make sure, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, so you've heard quite a bit about this downtown landmark and historic district feasibility study, but probably don't really exactly know what we're talking about. Um, this is basically just an informational only study that the landmark board was interested in having done. Um, just It will kind of help to inform code amendments that are going to happen downtown, potentially. Um, and it's just, just for information only. So, And please feel free to ask questions as we go if you, if you want to. It's kind of long. OK, so um, to start out, uh, we talked a little bit about historic resources inventory already. Um, that's part of what the board is charged with doing. Um, We'll go over just briefly kind of what it is. So as I said, it's a, a list of properties that are 50 years or older, and it's approximate. It's when you do a survey like this for um, a whole city, you just do it based on visual qualities. So you just go around and say, this looks about 50 years old or whatever. Um, we're going to survey that one. So it's not exact. Um, we make forms, historic property inventory forms for each resource, each um, building, structure, site, or object. The majority of them are buildings, obviously. Um, those are stored in the wizard database, which is the state's database of uh, historic and architectural data. Um, so the forms have kind of a description of the resource. They uh, mention styles, 
and kind of an estimated date of construction. There's photographs, um, integrity level, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then there's usually a note about whether or not it's eligible for the Bothell Register or the National Register or the Washington Heritage Register. Um, and the national and state registers are not something that's determined at the, at the city level, um, only at the, the state level. So we're not gonna talk about that in this, in this project really. Um, so basically the landmark board is kind of through me, is charged with adding and editing resources annually. So if something gets demolished, we take it off the, you know, uh, the inventory. Um, and ideally you should have new forms for each resource every 10 years, but that's really pretty much impossible to make that happen um, on like a large scale. So we just do as much as we can every year. Um, and so as we said before, this is different than the Bothell Register. We kind of talked about that. Does anyone have questions about the register first? I think we kind of understand the difference, hopefully. Um, and if not, please ask. Um, so in terms of the historic resources inventory, um, the downtown buildings were all kind of added in the original inventory, which was in 1988. Um, a lot of them have not been updated since then. There's a few that have, particularly on Main Street, that have been, um, uh, we call it surveying, surveyed since um, the last maybe 10 years or so with all of the stuff going on downtown. Um, they've been updated, but not actually from the landmark board stand standpoint or the city standpoint. It's always been a consulting firm working for a developer or something like that. Um, so the, the landmark board just uh, asked that we take a close look at the downtown, see what's left there and kind of, you know, where we should go from there. So about integrity. So integrity basically means that if you look at this building, does it look like the original building? If you look at it, can you tell that the building on the right here is this building from, you know, this is 1929, this is recent. So clearly this one has a high level of integrity because you can look at it and say, yes, that's the same building. And underneath that uh, canopy there, these windows are still there. They're just kind of boarded up and painted. So high level of integrity. This one is one you might call um, a medium level of integrity because it's still the same building. You can see a lot of the features are intact. We've got the same front area here. This is here. The door has been changed and this area has been modified a little bit. They took a door out and put like, I think there was maybe an ATM there at one point or something. Um, so that one's kind of medium, but anything from medium to high level is generally con considered you know, significant enough to put on the inventory. So here's a version of a low level of, of integrity. <laughs> you can tell this building is clearly not the same as that one anymore. Um, and this is something that happened a lot, as you can see by looking down downtown Bothell, in kind of like the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, they did this a lot. Um, they just covered up all the features or took them off. A lot of times it's actually been removed and you just can't tell till you get in there. So the, um, the hiccup with all this is that um, changes over time can often be significant in their own right. So like if you have altered a building like over here, this is the, oops, wrong one. This is the Masonic Lodge, the Ashler Lodge on Main Street. This is definitely not what it looks like today. Um, and it doesn't look like when it was originally constructed, but that's a significant change. Um, and the way that you determine kind of what's significant is what, and what isn't is by a couple of things. Um, one, the date. So was this resource actually altered during the period of significance? Um, the period of significance is kind of the date when it was, um, when it was built or when it was actively used or something like that. Um, style, does it represent any kind of a style of the time period? So clearly that one, uh, well, we'll talk more about it. Um, and then associ associative significance, which is basically like historical significance. Does it represent the building's overall significance in any way? So in this case, it does. So to go a little deeper into this one as a, like a case study sort of. Um, so this is what it looked like originally, obviously 1908. And then about 1939, they took out this whole storefront and they covered it with vitrolite for this new kind of modern streamlined look. Um, so to go through the, the changes, the date was 1939, so that's clearly within the period of significance for the building. Um, the style is streamlined modern, so it's, it's, it was very popular at the time to turn storefronts, especially along main streets, into that style. Um, and buildings were being built in that style as well. And then materials too. So vitrolite, the structural grass tile, that stuff was really popular in the late 30s and early 40s. Um, the metal signage on the front there, this is the metal letters up here. Um, the plate glass and even the stucco. The stucco was something that they did with um, the streamlined modern style. 
Um, and then associative significance. This has actually been a Rexall drugs from 1908 until 1980. So the changes within that, the, that whole period are relevant because it was you know, the same store. It was different owners, different like families owned it, but a large part of it, it was Crawford's. Um, so here's another example. So this one, um, it's not a huge change, but this was built kind of in that early um, neoclassical style. You can see there's a lot more detailing up here in this arch. Um, and then they, they did an art deco remodel in 1939, the same time that they were remodeling the, the other building across the street. Um, and this one is significant as a, an art deco building because it's still intact. Um, same thing in this one. So this one, people are always shocked by this one, but this was done in 1954, and um, it wasn't like a high style remodel, like it doesn't scream a particular style to you, but you can tell that it was definitely a 50s remodel because of the materials and like the asymmetrical storefront um, and all the windows. So that one is also significant kind of in its own right. And then, so when we're talking about integrity, especially in a local register, it's not always just the integrity that matters. Um, a lot of time the significance can actually play a really big factor in that. Um, like for this building, the 1980 version, which is pretty close to what it is now, um, that it really isn't historically significant as, as that particular style of storefront. You know, it's like maybe in 20 years it will be, we don't know. <laughs> but for now it's not really. However, that building is really, um, is really important to the town. Uh, it was one of the first buildings built. It was the first brick building. It was the Hannon building. It's the Ashler Lodge. It's very visible on Main Street. So that one is still eligible for you know registers and, and it's still significant even though it's been modified to kind of a, a non-historic style. Here's another one, Hillcrest, oh, sorry. Hillcrest Bakery. Um, so this one was built in 1949 in a modern kind of a style. And in 1980, they decided to make it look more like a Dutch bakery. Um, and so even though Dutch bakery, this, this Dutch bakery style over here is not really a significant style, this is a really historic landmark for the city because it's been there as a bakery since 1949. Um, and it's just one of those things that everybody knows about, so. Okay, so a little more about the study. Um, like I said, it was initiated by the Landmark Board last year. Um, they got a grant from For Culture Conduct the Study. Uh, which means they basically direct me to do the study and they pay me with the four culture funds. Um, because if you guys don't know, I just work part-time. I'm just 10 hours a week, so I need that extra funding. Um, so the purpose of the study was, like I said, to determine how many buildings are actually eligible for the Bothell Register, um, how many buildings would be contributing properties in a historic district, and what is the period of significance for downtown. And also, is there kind of enough integrity in the whole downtown to establish a district, and if so, where? And then also discuss financial incentives a little bit for, um, for owners. Um, so I did wanna mention, we kind of talked about contributing properties, but um, when it comes to a district, the integrity level is less important than it is for an individual because they're judged on the whole. So we have to keep that in mind when we think about integrity there. So the period of significance for downtown Bothell, um, I came up with 1908 to 1968, because basically from 1908 to 1968, they were pretty much building consistently. Um, they're kind of grouped into, into like periods, but it's not very distinct periods and they're really kind of long periods. So like the first part, 1908 and 1911, there were fires on Main Street, so they ended up building a whole bunch right, right around that time um, to repair the ones that, that were burned. And then in kind of the mid 20s to the late 30s, there was the good roads movement that happened um, in the state and really the nation. And um, the roads were improved, the highways were improved. There was the, the Seattle to Everett Highway was, um, was put in, which is the Redbrook Road. And so people were coming and going and people were able to like move their, um, their you know, produce or their dairy products or whatever and actually sell it in Seattle as opposed to just having to stay here. So they were able to move farther out. Um, the same thing in the 40s and 50s, there was a lot of construction because the I-90 floating bridge opened um, in 1940. And then the same thing happened again when the Evergreen Point floating bridge opened in 1963. In kind of the 60s and 70s, there was another kind of boom. And then after that, it really slowed down. And after 1984, there was only seven of the buildings that are here now were built. So out of like, there's 54 in the study, um, and there's several more that are not in the study because they were too young. 
So, you know, out of, and plus there's a bunch that have been torn down since then. So, you know, out of like 60, 70 buildings, there's only um, seven were built after that. So that's how you get to the period of significance. So I should have put this earlier. Um, the study area is the downtown special review area, which you're probably all familiar with. Um, it seems kind of like a natural place to do the study because it already has a large concentration of historic structures um, and because the Landmark Board has uh, review um, duties over some of the projects in that area. So here are kind of the results. So this is for properties that are individually eligible for the Bothell Register. So I found that 24 of the buildings are individually eligible, um, and this is all based on their association with the development of downtown Bothell. The majority of them are commercial, as you can see there's a couple. So everything on here obviously is commercial except for this little guy right here, and then these are all residential, but even the residential ones are mostly converted into business use too. Um, so some of them in Bothell, some of them have a really high level of integrity, and then others kind of have a lower integrity but more significance. Um, so that's something to remember. Bothell has a lot of remodels too that are significant, so that's something to think about. Um, contributing properties, not just eligible on their own. These are the ones, some of these are eligible on their own, but a lot of them are eligible just as a group because they contribute to the district. So I found 34 total contributing properties. Six are residential, 28 are commercial. Um, and two of the 28 uh, might be considered contributing if the new Title 22 amendments actually go into effect because these two here that are in the darker yellow, they were built in 1976, so technically they can't be on the register or in the district right now because the, the code doesn't allow it. But they are making um, a potential amendment that would allow for things that are less than 50 years old if they contribute to a district. Um, so that, that's a possibility. So um, what I kind of recommend as far as if anyone was interested in doing a district, and again, it requires owner approval, so it's not something that you know the Landmark Board or the Planning Commission can just put in place, um, that the most logical place would be to do a commercial district here and add this building here because this is a, a pretty significant building. Um, basically, the, the commercial properties are significant kind of in their own right too, like as a group. And it's sort of a different level of significant, excuse me, significance than the residential properties. Even though they're all in the downtown area, there's a pretty clear separation of like where the residential properties are left. This all used to be residential here too, but it's not anymore. So um, it would make more sense to put a district kind of down here and then add in whatever is close by or you know if there's anything else around. We only studied this area, so I can't say if there's anything you know nearby. Um, you could consider at some point doing maybe a residential study to see kind of from this area and up, because up higher there's more um, residential area. So that's a possibility. Um, so any questions about all of that before we go into? I've got a question, Sarah. Yeah. I'm a little curious why number 21, the Lutheran Church, isn't in there, because it, it's pretty unique. And isn't it probably oh, from the it 60s? Should be. It oh, should OK. Be. Yeah. 21 should be yellow? It's on the previous slide. That's weird. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> OK. I'll have to send that one back for redo. Oops, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that's odd. That's weird. Okay, there we yeah, go. that is weird. Yeah, I know that's definitely contributing. Is, is there any um, indication of interest among the property owners? Of the been few, any outreach yet? No. Of the few that I've talked to, they were not interested. But um, no one's ever seen this kind of a you know, a whole study before. So maybe there'd be a little more interest once they see kind of what it is. And um, and they'd be involved in, in doing design guidelines too. So if they were interested, that would be something they could, you know, work toward what actually works for them. So. Oh, Sarah, uh, David Fleet from Planning Commission. Can you go back between this slide and the other slide and then back to the slide? I'm particularly looking at the, the residential up on 183rd. Okay. I see. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I will move on to financial incentives. So this, this section is really just kind of an outline of what's available and what might be available for certain buildings um, just to kind of help those property owners or any future property owners kind of begin their discussion of what to do. Um, so there are three financial incentive programs for owners of properties in King County. Um, the Special Tax Valuation for Historic Properties, the Four Culture Landmarks Capital Grants and Federal Historic Tax Credits. So 
when we're talking about uh, financial incentives, they're for rehabilitation of historic buildings, which means you are restoring parts of the building, but you're also making it like usable and livable for today. So we acknowledge that, you know, maybe a 1900 kitchen isn't going to work for, you know, today's homeowner, that kind of a thing. Um, so just briefly, the special tax valuation program, what that does is it subtracts the qualified rehab expenditure, so the money that you spend on your rehabilitation from your um, assessed value of your property. So there's a few few things you have to meet as far as actually being eligible for the program. It's gotta be listed in the Bothell Register, um, either individually or as a district. Has to be either private or income producing, so that's pretty much everyone. Um, it must be a substantial project, which means that it's 25% or more of the appraised value of just the improvements. So on Main Street, if we're talking about Main Street, that number is gonna be higher than it would be in like some neighborhood because usually the land is more, more valuable. But on Main Street, the buildings are, you know, the entire property almost. So. Um, and then it has to follow the Secretary of the Interior Standards, which is basically just um, some guidelines that say, they, they gear your project toward not destroying historic features and to, you know, keeping the ones that are important, things like that. Um, and that one is a really, really, really great tool that McMenamin used that. Um, so it's, it's something that happens quite a bit. We don't have really actually a lot in um, the Snohomish County portion as we do in King County, but they use it a lot in King County. Um, so the Four Culture Landmarks Capital Grant is the same program that we use here at the city for other um, types of grants. But again, it has to be listed individually or, or as a contributing property. Um, it could be private or income producing. This is one of the only grants you're ever gonna find where a private citizen can get it for rehabilitation. Um, it has to follow the Secretary of the Interior Standards and it's up to $30,000 for rehabilitation. So it can be really good for a smaller project or it can be just for part of a project, say like restoring a storefront or something like that. And then the federal program is a little bit different and they also, they modified it a few years ago with the tax change. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into it because it's pretty complex, but. Um, the, the, the resources have to be listed in the National Register. Um, in Bothell, there's a few that are eligible. The Suga one is eligible. This one for sure is eligible. Um, and I believe the Mills Music has been determined eligible, which I'm kind of surprised by, honestly, but um, it's been already determined. So this project is a similar guideline. It has to be a substantial project, but this one is calculated um, based on the adjusted, adjusted basis value of the property, which is a little more, you know, you, you really need a tax attorney for this one. It's for bigger projects usually. Um, and it must be in line with the Secretary of the Interior Standards. So that is financial incentives. Oh, actually, Sarah, yep. can you get David Fleet Planning Commission? So that uh, bottle hand therapy one there on the corner, can um, explain to me exactly why that one's fully, you said, it seemed to be one of the strongest candidate with regards to federal rehab. Yeah, there's, um, generally speaking, we can't make any, well, for sure, we can't make any determinations at, at a local level of what's eligible for um, national register. But through the course of different projects um, with environmental review, especially SEPA and Section 106, um, they look at those and they make determinations. So this one just happened to be already determined through another project that it is eligible. Um, and that is because of the style of building. It's called new formalism. It's something that is really rare, especially in this area. Um, and the architect, I can't remember offhand, I think it's Dunstan, but it's, it's a famous modern architect in this area as well. Um, yeah, so that, that's really why, why it's been determined that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A uh, quick question. <clears throat> I think C um, <clears throat> sorry, City of Seattle has a requirement where like a um, substantial renovation is 50% of the appraised value. And I think at that point, once you exceed that threshold, you have to build the, or bring the building up to current City of Seattle building code standards. Do we have the same exact language on the Bothell side? Um, I'm mainly thinking about like uh, old masonry buildings with the seismic upgrades that gets really costly. And these incentives I think would help dent that. But it, I mean, if you're talking about foundations and stuff, I mean, it makes it hard to preserve a building when you have to bring it up to current code. Would we use the uh, existing international uh, IBC code? Yeah. Okay. Do you know about that? I don't know that I know the answer to that question. <laughs> I can't say with 
uh, with 100% certainty, but I believe we have the same or similar language. Uh, that's pretty standard in most codes that I'm familiar with. Um, there are some provisions for historic structures, but that's yes. an area that's a little bit gray. So you can make some allowances, for example, um, if mm -hmm. it's if you're up if you're doing a, a replacement, you know, say the width of a, of the stairs, you know, if the historic stairs were not. <coughs> Uh, would not meet the current code, but you're replacing those stairs, you can replace those with like stairs to maintain the historic integrity. Um, just some examples like that. I, whether that would apply to uh, facade, masonry, or foundation, I don't know. <clears throat> Thanks, David. This is Carrie Westerbeck again. So we're moving on to the downtown amendments, I take it? Is that what you're saying? Oh, Otherwise, no. I, was, I might I might be willing to have some more discussion on this topic. Yeah, no, I thought so, too. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I was yeah, yeah. turning it over. I just, just wanted to clarify. Um, um, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I just, this is really exciting. When I, when I first got involved, you asked earlier, Mike, Michael, about, you know, our past and what we're doing currently. But when I was on the Landmark Preservation Board, I just, you know, I saw things changing in Bothell, and there's a lot of good change going on. Um, but there's some really cool, there are some really cool older buildings that I think um, strong towns, and I don't know if the, the organization, Bopop, but they're finding about infill developments. And I think there's this really kind of quirky, cool fabric that can be kind of maintained. And so I'm, I'm really happy to see the city um, looking at uh, the historic districts and the potential of um, adding them throughout. Um, I know they're, they're difficult to pull off, but I'm glad we're talking about this. Um, just with, um, so, Sarah, can you tell me more about what it would take to, I know, uh, I, I believe that there was a, this was purchased recently, basically this whole block, but but that residential component, uh, could you go back to that slide maybe again on 183rd? I just, I, I walk by it a lot. I just think it could be a super, I, I just see that as being a great opportunity to be a really dynamic place. So it's some really strong architecture, I feel like from, you know, the turn of the century up to the 30s. And most, I know, like, there's one up there that doesn't qualify. I guess you were saying because it, because of some facade that was put on the front of it potentially. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. But um, I don't know. So, what does it take for the city? What, what, how does that work? Because I know all, and all this stuff takes time and money and staff time. In terms of if you wanted to actually put a small historic district on that block, is that what mm -hmm. you're thinking? Gotcha. So first, what you would need to do is just get the property owners on board. There would need to be, as it's written now, um, uh, just a, a majority. Um, in this case, they're all owned by one person. So it really would have to be, you know, I've never <laughs> come across that before. Um, it's all spelled out in Title 22. It is. It is spelled out in Title 22, but not it's it's spelled out in the new Title 22 that may go into effect. Um, as it is now, it just says you just need a majority property owner. So this one person would have to sign off for each each property. Um, and at that point, you would go about either you could hire a consultant or you could maybe get the landmark board to get a grant if that's something they were interested in to have me do it or someone else do it. Um, or the property owner can write it themselves, but it's quite a bit of work. So generally, you're probably not going to want to do that. Um, yeah, it's really it's all up to the property owner to initiate. Okay. Sarah, is that right? There's one owner for all those Main Street buildings. I thought I thought there was a few different ones. The one on the far left, the church is not, but the um, we're talking about this block up here. Oh, I'm sorry. You you right meant here. the the residential block. Sorry, I thought you were starting to talk about Main Street. My my apologies. Yeah, yeah. they're I'm, all owned by one. Yep, <laughs> I, I was bouncing around. Yeah, Main Street would be the same process. It would just require somebody to go out and do a petition, you know, to get signatures. So for the. Yeah. The residential area, you had talked about um, that that might make more sense as a larger residential district extending north of 185th, too. And at that point, then, uh, and when you talk about a majority of property owners, is it by number of properties or value of property or? One, it, one, it, one property, one vote. Right. But uh, those, those properties on 183rd, uh, uh, six through ten, those are all still separate parcels. Correct. 
they're all owned by one entity. Does each property get a vote? Yes. Okay. Got it. Thank you for clarifying that. I think it's a really special little spot. I think it's a, it could really continue the fabric from Main Street and past the church up to that there. Thank you. Sarah, uh, this is Karsten with the Planning Commission. Um, uh, uh, as a geologist, I have a special interest in seismic um, safety. And um, the Office of Emergency Management has listed 24 properties in this downtown district of having potentially unreinforced masonry on the structures or the facades. Um, uh, would you see the, the uh, formation of a district here enabling property owners to more easily and financially, maybe financially afford to do um, improvements if necessary? And um, if not, um, do the historic property inventories that would be completed by um, periodically um, provide updates to um, Office of Emergency Management on maybe changes or developments um, and uh, updates to structures in terms of seismic safety? Um, for the first part of the question, um, I definitely think it would be it would be easier for owners to have some sort of you know financial help with that through the through the tax credits and the um, the landmarks capital grant is really a great one. Um, as far as the other question, I don't know how they gather their data, so I don't know that recently there was a survey that was conducted um, looking for all the URM buildings in in the state, and they contacted me and you know everybody else in the in my role in other uh, states or other cities um, to see kind of what they suspect are, are unreinforced masonry buildings. So if, if that's their method, I don't know if that's something that, you know, we can update them when they contact us. But generally, we don't send that information that I'm aware of. Mm. Um, yeah, I really, I don't think I know how to answer that question. <laughs> so you probably were the one who forwarded them the 24 properties that they... They had some asked. already, and then I just kind of filled in what I thought was or what I knew wasn't or vice versa, you know. Is there an easier way for maybe um, city record keeping or property owner engagement to provide you with information about whether they've um, brought their sites up to standards? You know, not that I know of. I mean, I think they probably pull from the wizard database, which has the, would have, you know, periodically updated, like you said. Um, I don't know if they maybe contact the city for permitting records you know I really don't know how that would how that would work interesting okay yeah well thanks oh yeah the tax credit um, so the the valuation the special valuation tax credit is actually good for 10 years so they'll subtract the amount of your rehabilitation from your property for 10 years. So it can it can be very, very, especially if you have a large project, you can end up paying no property taxes for 10 years. So it's a good deal. And the same with the uh, um, the four culture grant, you can apply every year. So. So is there any more discussion people want to have about that? Or should we make sure we keep moving on? Because I don't want to short us on anything if people have more comments. And Sarah, was this mostly an update because um, you're in the middle of the study and I know we're going to keep hearing from you as, uh, as the commission, so. Yes. But this is what a chance for the planning commission to get brought up to speed, it sounds like. I didn't know you'd already done so much, even though you keep us updated, so it's great. Yeah, it's pretty much done. I think I'll have the report finished for you guys by, by the meeting. Oh, that's comments. right. You said that yesterday. I remember now. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Um, as far as next steps goes, like we said, this is just for information only, um, but it will give us guidance for the types of buildings that are there, what um, features are important for each of the buildings, um, so that when we look at developing codes for downtown, we can say, well, is this actually informing the buildings we have downtown, or is it you know, not really relevant? So it'll help us kind of guide that discussion. All right. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, David for a discussion of uh, code amendments. Downtown. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so now, yeah, we'll move into downtown code amendments. And
and uh, we'll be led by uh, staff member David Boyd. And uh, again, this is just uh, no action needed. This is for information and discussion only. All right, thank you and good evening. Um, I just have a brief uh, presentation. Uh, this is just the opening uh, session on this. Uh, we will be uh, bringing this back to Planning Commission on, on December 18th. Uh, but uh, so here we have the, uh, the vision, downtown vision that's on the, uh, on the cover of the, of the downtown plan. And there's a lot of new development on here, but um, sometimes what might get lost is that the vision clearly shows that Main Street retains uh, much of its uh, character. There's infill uh, where there are parking lots in, in places and new development along the, the boulevard, but, but it really does show that uh, uh, that remains uh, intact in, in the vision. Um, the uh, outline there, that shows the, the outlines of the downtown special review area that were established with the downtown plan. Um, and again, tonight our focus really is predominantly on Main Street. Uh, but the, um, the downtown historic resources regulations also uh, apply to uh, uh, register eligible properties, uh, both within the, the DSRA and outside, uh, also uh, properties that are already on the register outside the DSRA, uh, like uh, uh, the Anderson School and the, the uh, properties, historic properties at the park in uh, Bothell Landing. Uh, so, um, all our, although our focus tonight is mostly on Main Street, uh, these, this section of the code does apply uh, to uh, register properties and register eligible properties uh, throughout the downtown sub area. So the purpose is really to preserve and restore uh, historic structures in downtown, especially along Main Street. Uh, that was the direction that, uh, that we got uh, very strongly from council in the last uh, couple of years, in part in reaction to some potential redevelopment uh, uh, along Main Street. So there's three ways to do that. The first priority would be to preserve and restore entire structures. Uh, second priority would be to preserve and restore uh, and or restore uh, facades. And then finally, uh, uh, to make sure that we have guidelines to ensure that new structures uh, that we get new structures that respect and complement the historic fabric. So the downtown plan, uh, although the the main focus is on this uh, historic resources uh, regulations, which I'll get to shortly. As we as we got to reviewing this, we realized that there are also some need to uh, review the the section of the downtown plan that precedes that, which is basically a compendium of some of the styles in downtown. So. Uh, there was earlier discussion about, you know, uh, what what styles might uh, uh, be included in a historic district. Downtown is quite eclectic, uh, so uh, it it starts with uh, the early 20th century commercial styles that are shown here, uh, but then goes on to the present day. So there are just a couple of amendments that I wanted to highlight here. Uh, it references uh, the uh, Bothell design guidelines, building styles, and features that the uh, Bothell Landmark Preservation Board uh, uh, put together in 2007. Uh, uh, we're just gonna amend that or say the most recent revision because that is gonna be uh, revised. Uh, we're adding a little description below uh, uh, before we start into the different styles, um, explaining that we're starting with the commercial styles uh, and then the predominantly residential styles, uh, just because they do hop around uh, in, in time, and it, that might be a little confusing uh, at first blush. And then uh, you'll notice that uh, this, this style is, is shown to uh, uh, go between uh, 1900 and 1930, and then the next page we skip to contemporary styles, uh, 1950s to present, so we're missing uh, 30, 20 years there. Uh, and we're also missing an important style in, in Sarah's estimation, the, the mid 20th century styles. So we're in, proposing to insert that as uh, section B uh, and then uh, renumber the, the uh, subsequent ones uh, and, um, and change the date uh, so that uh, the mid century styles are from 1930 to 1970 and the contemporary styles from 1970 to the present. Th there is certainly overlap, these aren't 
fixed uh, uh, hard uh, dates, but uh, and and perhaps we'll add a uh, a phrase to that effect in that uh, section up front as well. And then the other thing is then we would take these uh, these pictures, which are just illustrations of those styles, and and remove the Bothell First Lutheran Church. Uh, or move it into the mid-century styles, um, and, along with uh, some other ones, like the Suga Gallery building that fit there. So that we just kind of reorganize this page a little bit to uh, to fit that other style in. And then we get to the historic uh, historic resources regulations, which are the main focus. Um, so one thing that we're uh, going to do is make this map more readable. Uh, as you can see, this is a fairly low resolution one, and the one that uh, we have available for the code is, is as well. So we're going to try to tighten up the uh, the area, make the, the legend larger and more readable, uh, and then make any updates uh, necessary. We don't think there are any uh, just yet, because we just um, made this change uh, last year. Um, uh, the, in, in the rest of the regulations, we're correcting some references. Uh, those are fairly minor changes. Uh, and we're uh, making a change. Uh, throughout, we're looking at uh, language in, in the regulations that, is, uh, uh, that are basically fit into the guidelines portion uh, uh, and looking at whether some of those guidelines should actually be requirements. And there's a statement up front uh, that uh, says that these regulations should be uh, used for projects within the DSRs, SRA or on the register or eligible for the register, and we're just saying that's mandatory. They shall be. Um, uh, so we're trying to get rid of some of the wishy-washy language. There are other places where the guide, where it is appropriate to have guidelines, and 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 we're keeping them as such. Uh, as Sarah talked about, uh, we're also adding uh, language in there that recognizes that, uh, in some cases, renovations have their own historical value. Uh, these are some examples that she showed, slightly different photographs. Uh, so um, on the uh, uh, Hanas, what is now Hana Sushi, was the uh, Bothell First National Bank, or Bothell State Bank. Uh, it had a, a very distinct uh, sort of neoclassical uh, brick uh, structure that was then uh, stuccoed over and into, well, I guess both could be considered neoclassical. This one is more Art Deco uh, 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 playing on uh, some classical forms uh, there. And uh, the need for some uh, recognition of that and, and improving these codes came forward when we were reviewing some proposals uh, for a renovation on uh, this storefront and trying to determine what do we do we ask them to try to uncover this uh, is that even feasible uh, but uh, uh, restoring this facade to its uh, original original renovated uh, condition would be uh, would also be acceptable uh, similarly, uh, across the street, uh, this is the uh, what is now Three Lions Pub, uh, as it uh, was originally built. Uh, it was renovated into this, um, what did you call it, um, modern yeah. uh, style, uh, and uh, uh, during the period of significance, and, uh, and so uh, that's one where we wouldn't necessarily be uh, looking necessarily, if, if they came in and said, no, we want to go back to that, and they could do it, pull it off, uh, that would be very much supported. Uh, but also uh, restoring this to its uh, uh, newly renovated uh, splendor would be uh, another option. Uh, now, uh, you're probably familiar with the re uh, renovations to Alexa's. Uh, there, they had been hoping to be able to uncover uh, more of the original brick. Uh, and restore that, but uh, most of it uh, above the the uh, transom was gone. They were able to restore the transom, uh, but they did a new brick uh, facade throughout. Uh, and in 50 years or 48, or uh, <laughs> maybe that will be considered significant uh, in, in its own right. Um, so those are uh, some of the uh, um, uh, items. I uh, also wanted to address the value of saving part of the original masonry on, on the masonry buildings. 
Uh, in the case of uh, Alexa's, um, oops, uh, they, they did the, there was original uh, brick here, uh, and it had been painted, but it was original, and I think there was some also along the bulkhead. Um, but th they didn't have an original brick here and could not, f there wasn't a, 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 a match to replace that with. So they chose to replace all of the brick. Um, and we're proposing it as a guideline, so it's not uh, hard and fast, but we would have liked to have had a little more leverage to, to convince them to perhaps uh, save that original brick up to the canopy, have a, 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 a natural break, and then do something uh, different that, that uh, would complement that above. And then we also want to address canopies. On these older pictures, you see some of the uh, period appropriate canopies. Not all buildings had them. Uh, but we would, we generally encourage uh, weather pr protection. Uh, so uh, on a building that didn't uh, initially have a canopy, we would, uh, if they wanted to put a canopy on, uh, as Alexa's uh, did, we encourage, already encourage uh, them to do a more period appropriate uh, flat canopy. And we've, uh, we're addressing that in the code. Uh, uh, canopies continued on the other side. Uh, um, the Logston building got a very similar new canopy. Uh, we would like to, we've incorporated some language in the code that would encourage uh, something that was more similar to these uh, older, uh, lower profile canopies that, that uh, obscure less of the historic facade. Uh, so that's also included in the, uh, the draft code amendments. We also uh, realized with the Main Street construction, we, it was discovered that uh, these buildings on the north side of uh, the one, uh, 101 block of uh, Main Street uh, are all set back about four feet from the property line. Um, it makes for lovely wider sidewalks. You've probably noticed that the sidewalks are much wider on the north side than on the south side. Uh, but the regulations require a zero setback. Um, if any of these properties did uh, redevelop and then built out to the sidewalk, it would create a very disjointed uh, uh, street front. So we've addressed that in the regulations where, so that on this block, new development would have to maintain the predominant uh, uh, building uh, line. And then we, uh, getting back to the, uh, the historic resources code addresses awnings, but really doesn't address canopies at all. So. Uh, we've talked about uh, uh, addressing uh, canopies, but we also thought it was appropriate to uh, add to the uh, language about awnings uh, and address uh, rollout awnings as a period appropriate uh, option. And they are still available. Uh, this is the, the Banana Republic store in, in downtown Seattle. Uh, here you see a couple of buildings, the Logston building and the old bank building with rollout awnings. Um, uh, uh, at one point in their history, and just a uh, couple of other examples of how those can be uh, used uh, and, and are, are quite appropriate for historic buildings. Uh, beyond the regulations, uh, uh, Sarah talked about the preservation incentives uh, that are available now. Uh, uh, beyond that, uh, as we've gotten into this, we have delved a little bit into uh, uh, um, other incentives, although the, our main charge here is really to look at the regulations, um, but uh, one thing that uh, could come out of that this would be a recommendation to council that uh, beyond the regulations that uh, that council consider um, devoting some resources to other uh, incentives, for example, transfer of development rights. Uh, these illustrations just show how you can. There are a number of different ways you can do that. You can uh, take a historic building that. Um, that uh, um, that doesn't fill its whole zoned volume and allow it to sell that volume uh, to adjacent properties. You can establish a district and allow them to to transfer those development rights uh, within the district, uh, or you can do it uh, to um, protect special features, like in this case, uh, a stream and a, and a roadway with a historic bridge. Or you could uh, uh, set it up so that uh, they could be transferred out of the district, for example, from, from historic uh, buildings on Main Street to Canyon Park if, 
if we can uh, set set things up to make that uh, make that work. It does require that there be a pent up demand uh, for those development rights. Uh, so it's something that requires a fair amount of study, more than we have uh, that we have capacity to do uh, with these code amendments. But we are uh, looking into those and potential others. Um, uh, so with that. Uh, I open it up for questions and comments, and and I just uh, we put these two images to to reinforce that um, uh, when it comes to applying the historic uh, guidelines to you know what what is historic uh, in a, a uh, area like downtown Bothell, it's not always the buildings that uh, that uh, uh, people typically think of. Um, uh, this is uh, a, a modern style. Uh, it could be. Uh, considered uh, googie, uh, which is uh, kind of the style of the space needle, the space age uh, architecture uh, that uh, has some value uh, of its own. Uh, so um, entertain questions and comments. Again, our, our main, uh, well, kind of flipping the, the uh, uh, tables, uh, this will go back to planning commission, since this is, these are amendments to the uh, Title 12. Um, uh, but so this is really the uh, main opportunity for the landmark board to directly give feedback uh, on these. But we certainly would like to have an open discussion with both uh, the board and the commission. Uh, and uh, and I'd also like to say that uh, uh, for board members who uh, aren't here, or weren't able to stay for the whole meeting, we'll, we we certainly would uh, welcome comments uh, between uh, either in writing or or uh, otherwise uh, between now and the December 18th public hearing, Planning Commission public hearing. Um, at next week's Landmark Board, if, if there is a interest in uh, any of the board members attending that, we would ask that you uh, appoint designated uh, 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 members so that, so that we aren't doing another joint meeting and, and don't need to advertise it as a joint meeting. Uh, and avoid a quorum. So with that, uh, and I'm happy to take this back to any of the images uh, if you have questions. Thanks, Dave. Just real quick, um, I don't know, uh, back on page one of the potential architectural styles, attachment one, page one, is it, what is the um, part A of that? Is that, is that, is it something that wasn't included? I mean, they oh. just have parts of it. Yeah, let me go back. That, those were the uh, early. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, oh, okay, got it. The early 20th century commercial styles. Commercial, thank you. So we're not making any changes to that section. We're just noting that uh, right. the end date of that one left a 20-year gap in our in our compendium of styles. And these are. They, these are included in the development regulations. They aren't really regulations. They're really more, uh, it's more background information to give developers uh, 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 a better understanding of what styles uh, we have and, and what some of the key features are. Great. Thank you. I looked at that several times when I was working on my pro project and got to know the downtown code very well. And I had wondered about the missing period. So I thought you were just pulling examples out and, and it did seem like there was this substantial piece, but like you'd pull elements of it into here and the other one. So I thought, well, yeah, there's the Lutheran church. So, but good work, Sarah, pointing that out and saying we should have, have some cohesiveness. Thank you. I know Dave did great work on this originally, so not to impugn you. Mr. Chair, I just want to note for the record that um, the landmark board lost a quorum. So we're down to three members. Um, Okay. Member, member, member Dimmitt had to leave uh, at about 7.33. Okay. I, I don't think it's a problem. We're not, this is a study session. There's right. no action that's being requested right. of, of the board this evening. So. I don't think it is either. Yeah, so I just want to make, like, if that's okay. make that thank you. for the record. Okay, thank you. And, and I was going to, uh, I made a note uh, uh, when um, board member Moritz left to uh, make sure to get an email out to the, the whole board that, that uh, uh, if they would like to uh, send us uh, comments, uh, uh, that would be appreciated. Great. Yeah. By the same token, if the board 
feels you would really like to see this in more detail as a full board, uh, we can schedule a time to do that at uh, one of your upcoming meetings. It definitely overlaps with a lot of work we do because we only review projects in downtown. But um, I mean, I think for now, we can probably review what if it was brought to our attention, we can review the work you do and maybe let Sarah know if we think it's something we should talk about together jointly again. I don't know how other people feel about that. Yeah, okay. Only a couple of us left. <laughs> Either jointly or just. Or just, or yeah. Just just, board. Okay. And maybe this is when we jump into that thing that David and I were talking about yesterday where, you know, are, are we trying to develop incentives to keep some of those, those, um, this precious inventory? Because we really haven't built any, I, I, I sometimes joke, but it's not really a joke. We haven't built anything on Main Street in 30, 40 years. Our codes don't allow us to build Main Street much anymore. So what are we doing to keep it? And because uh, I know right now, I think there's a whole block that might be on the chopping block soon if we don't develop something the where Gallo de Oro is and that fantastic old 40s bank and the um, the build, building you looked at earlier Sarah I always forget it's the, um, it's the Eagles the whatever building yeah technically it's the Hannon building but it's yeah. also the Ashler Ashler yeah because yeah. there's always talk about what's going to happen on that block yeah with the EFG sale and things like that right so we don't have much teeth uh, right now to or, or carrots. So we do have some, though. The, yep, yep. the, the uh, historic resources regulations do give us some uh, leverage to uh, work with uh, developers to, to preserve uh, those buildings or, or at least the facades. Uh, the upper level setback uh, creates an opportunity right. to save a facade in a way that where it can somewhat stand on its own. Um, and uh, and and the incentives that that Sarah has identified are, are available to uh, yeah. any of the eligible properties. So um, th we have some tools. Yeah. And and the other thing I wanted to say is the way that the those downtown historic resources are um, and the the archi architectural styles, although it's not a historic district, it basically is very similar to the the guidelines that we would be creating for a historic district and and in the case of downtown they're for the most part ready made there'd probably be some some uh, additional tweaks to be made uh but that would certainly give us uh, more leverage because except for uh well i guess the market the Merck uh was just vacant vacant land like the last piece of vacant land on main street for years was it was an old house and like a hillside, wasn't it? Something like that. I'm trying to remember what was there. It was wasn't much. It was a home, well, site. It was a, a home site. It was yeah. actually a building that uh, had been uh, the Bothell's first schoolhouse. Oh, okay, it yeah. Was, uh, I believe it was a house at some point in its history, but it was moved to the park at Bothell Landing. So, and then uh, it was uh, the old building yeah. that they kind of partially restored. Because I'm just trying to do a mental uh, recollection of we haven't really had anything except. Um, but we still don't have where, where um, Bothell Mall burned down. We still don't right. have a building there. So I'm just thinking we haven't really seen any, haven't had to deal with anyone trying to tear something down and build something new yet, like right. we might see on that 105 block, whatever it is. So it's uh, interesting times maybe. That's the only why I ask because, like, um, I, I wonder if any of the incentives we have are strong enough, that's all, to really, because developers, as we talked about yesterday, it's often a lot easier and faster and they make more money if they get to tear something down and put something new up. There is one uh, new uh, building on Main Street, the um, oh, yeah. building that... Uh, 10 years old, right? That's right. That uh, Sushi Zone and... Yeah, of course. Uh, um, I forgot. Revolve, uh, are in on the ground floor. Um, That's right. And that was, a, that was a, a property owner who was determined to build something that that really did fit into the historic uh, yeah. uh, fabric. In fact, he yeah, said... Yeah, they went above and beyond. Yeah. That's um, right. And, yes. and uh, that was uh, the drive-through of the of the Bothell State Bank. Uh, uh, so there was no... Well, there was the demolition of the little drive-through canopy, but... Right, right. No, no significant I demolition. I remember that now, yeah. So, yeah, stand correct. There has been one. Yeah. That was like 2008 or so, I think. And, and actually it was done... Um, prior to the adoption of the downtown plan. So mm -hmm. that was really the, the developer's uh, um, 
uh, initiative. So not to belabor the point, but like what we're seeing in Bothell is, you know, big, massive overhauls of these sites. They're going to want to build as much as they possibly can um, at a lowest cost and reap the largest profit. And I shudder to think what that will yield on Main Street because the other sites it's happened on, well, that's fine. I kind of mourn the loss of Ricketts a little bit because that was a pretty cool property, but I think they could have done some interesting McMenamins like stuff there, but bygones. But I don't know. I mean, uh, Merck even isn't very, in my professional opinion, particularly um, Main Street friendly. I mean, it's fine, but huge missed opportunity on the north side. So I don't know. I'm just rambling, but I feel like we have some pretty fantastic stuff there that um, developers are not going to probably try very hard to keep once they get a hold of the properties. So I don't have any solutions at the moment. It's just something I think about as landmark board and a, and a citizen. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, it sounds <laughs> like that's the, yeah, that's, that's what's so cool about what we're doing, I think. Trying to create the district. Right. Actually get some more, uh, yeah, some teeth. I mean, that's, that's why I mentioned yesterday. I'd, I'd, I'd gone online and, and talked to people on various forums that are involved in this kind of work and tried to find out what other people have done you know, precedent, and Sarah's probably more, and Dave and Mike, you might be more tapped into it, to that, what cities do to, to incentivize keeping historic properties. Um, like I say, incentive versus a stick versus a penalty. And I'm not well versed in that, but someone must do it, or maybe they just decide they're going to be more draconian about, well, you will save this, and we're going to put it in a uh, historic district, and you can't touch it, or something like that. I don't know. We seem a, a little hands off about it, like Sarah's explained to us on the board. We can kind of advise, but we can't force. So it just relates to design, the design district and the, um, the choices we all have to make, uh, both planning commission and landmark to review projects and then guide council on what we want to see down there. Absolutely. Any other thoughts, feedback? Jason Hampton here from Planning Commission. Just one quick question on the uh, north side of Main Street where the building facades line up but don't meet the property line. Is requiring, and it's on page eight of the attachment, uh, section B, item three, is requiring that they not, or not allowing them to build to their property line is that even legal? And I mean, has the city attorney reviewed that? Not yet. That's that was a question that we raised and, and are are going to be uh, uh, asking for advice on that uh, from the uh, city attorney prior to the planning commission hearing. Okay. It seems like if you change the setback in a zone, then maybe you could accomplish that. But it seems kind of like very spotty to me. So I just want to make sure that we're uh, addressing that. So thank you. Uh, in any case, we would accompany this with uh, a, a notation in the uh, setbacks for the downtown core to, to note this exception. So we'd basically be establishing a, a different setback for Main Street, but we still want to make sure that we're, we're, uh, we're okay with that. Okay, and then a point of clarification on the, the glass. I'm looking for it now, but it said, I think it would preclude opaque glass. Is, is that what the intention is, so people don't use opaque windows and just create it? Okay, Correct. perfect. Just want to make sure I understood that. It's a good idea. And there's already uh, language saying that um, it, it uh, doesn't allow translucent glass, but it doesn't specifically allow uh, or uh, prohibit uh, opaque glass, so we wanted to make sure we were covered there. Okay, thanks. I had uh, two brief comments. Um, one was... Uh, Back in April, we did code amendments for small cell wireless. And I don't know how um, that really plays into the obscuring of um, historical features. But is that if we had a small cell wireless provider come in and look to attach a facility to an existing facade in this, uh, in, on a historic structure, how would the um, 
how would that code process look at this moment? It's a timely question because the council adopted the wireless communications ordinance last night. Um, but the design guidelines that the, the commission developed that went into the design standards for the city, um, they really address uh, light poles in the right of way. So if they wanted to attach something to a building, then we would regulate that through these design standards. So it would, it would have a different set of uh, requirements from that standpoint. And in terms of the, the, the poles that they would go on, if it's one of the decorative poles that we have in the downtown district, um, they would have to, as you recall, they, we have standards for how those would have to be put on those poles, how they would have to work with the design, um, or if they had to put up a new pole, it would have to match that design. So the framework is really up to um, the department's discretion on um, blending into um, historical um, features. If it was, I mean, we would allow attachments of small cell facilities onto structures if that, if there weren't amendments or changes to what was um, issued by planning commission. I, I wasn't at the meeting last night, so I didn't watch it either. Um, but I'm I'm wondering if um, like is that something that would go through landmarks board if a uh, facility was proposed on on a historical facade because of its location of prominence? I believe so. I'm I'm not sure exactly um, for a couple of reasons. One is. Because this comes under FCC regulations, there are limitations on what we can and cannot regulate at the city level. For in the, for in the right of way, they put some additional restrictions on us, so I have a better understanding of that. Um, and what we've been told so far from our outside attorney who works with all of the um, wireless providers on these issues, typically they don't put them on a building. Uh, they, they want them on a pole because they need that 360 um, exposure in order for the signal to, to work. That's not to say it couldn't happen because that is provided for in the code and in those design guidelines. And what we do is we look, if, um, as I recall, in the guidelines and in the ordinance, there's a hierarchy of where they can locate those. So first, we want them you know, on an existing pole uh, in the right of way if possible. Okay. But I think we can my understanding at least is if they're proposing it on a building and we have design standards, whether it's historic or otherwise, um, that they would be subject to those standards. There may be some limitations on that, but we would apply them to the fullest extent possible. Okay, thanks for that clarification. The last comment that I had was um, on page 10 of attachment one, um, item D5, street furnishings. Etc. shall be simple and be limited to a maximum of two designs. Could um, I get clarification on what that means in terms of, um, yeah, what limited to a maximum of two designs, what does that, what does that mean? I think that was a, a reaction to the fact that at that time we had uh, quite a hodgepodge of street furnishings in downtown and um, and to a certain extent, we still do. The, the uh, uh, east portion of Main Street uh, still has some probably 70s era uh, street lighting. Uh, the police building across the street has some uh, uh, historical style uh, 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 lighting fixtures that were done, put in place there. Um, uh, so there's there's a mix, and um, as redevelopment occurs, as either street projects are done or um, uh, private development is done that is required to do street frontages, um, they are uh, adhering to the downtown uh, guidelines, not just for street fixtures, but also uh, other street furnishings. So the idea was just, just to have a more cohesive uh, feel for all of the downtown streets, but it'll take some time before we... Uh, fully realize that. So do those street furnishings include, say, planter boxes as well? Or is that, I'm just thinking, like, are we 
marrying ourselves into a certain design from here forevermore. <laughs> uh, until, I guess until the code is changed uh, or the, 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 the uh, direction is changed. But uh, uh, planter boxes, there are not many, and it and doesn't prevent a private property owner from putting out um, their own uh, different thing on their on their frontage. Uh, may if it's in the street right away, they may require a, a street use permit. Um, but um, the idea was to to have have a more uh, cohesive uh, feel. Okay, thanks. Just kind of. Um Piggybacking a little bit in a different direction off of what uh, Commissioner Hampton, was, this is Dave Fleet from Planning Commission, um, and maybe this is a question for Sarah too, since you're kind of in this realm. I mean, there are, and to Gar Carrie's point, like we are kind of at a critical time potentially of when things could change, and that's what we're trying to address here. I mean, there are there are spots in in the city of Seattle, say, that. Um, that where the, the real estate value is even higher potentially than than, than Main Street and Bothell right now, and I'm, I'm, I, I think, and I'm thinking of of places that I've visited in like Madison Park, and maybe some Wallingford areas, and maybe that's. It seems like in some of those areas they haven't. It, there hasn't been a lot of change, and it's still really active space, and I have a lot of old storefronts. Do you know if are there are they doing anything particular there that we're not looking at here that are kind of ways we may want to go towards preservation? I don't know of any specifics. Um, I do know that they have a lot more uh, historic districts and sort of like um, conservation districts or like particular standards for certain areas um, that are effectively historic districts. And I think that's probably a lot of what it is. Um, they, they, as far as I know, they use uh, transfer development rights in some areas, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it would apply to like Wallingford or anything like that. Okay. But really they have a really strong program for discouraging demolition of historic buildings. They have a lot more teeth in their, in their, uh, in their program. Get, and that's kind of what I was getting at. Like, yeah. are we, is that what we're doing here? Are, are we going? Are, are we making it strong enough to, for, on these historic districts that we're trying to create? Kind of following that path. Well, if you did create an actual historic district, it would have that kind of teeth. But okay. In terms of just design guidelines, we, we, you know, there's a limit to how far you can take it without it really being a, you know, a taking of property rights. So there's a real, there's a balance there, a fine line. Right. Yeah. Does Seattle do theirs by already? Like you say, the teeth in Seattle's because they they made them conservation districts and and uh, design dist or design districts or whatever, um, and that's what allows them to make owners toe the line, as it were, and keep okay. So they, yeah, they that's really what that. does it because you have to actually have those right. You know, in so place. they've gotten they they have a similar process where they have to get all fifty percent plus one something like that. Do you think? Yeah, I I actually think they don't have a limit in their code for how much they have to get, but I've been told that they shoot for 100%. Oh, wow. Okay. Which is high. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> which I'm sure they don't get all the time, but... <laughs> yeah. But they can get a minor, a majority, a mm -hmm. substantial majority, and then the other's just going to have to fall in. Okay. Yep. Interesting. I do know in, in my neighborhood of Seattle and Ballard, there is a historic district on Ballard Avenue uh, that has very tight controls uh, on Market Street, however, um, uh, there isn't. There is are, there are some new, uh, uh, fairly sp substantial developments along Market Street. On the core of Market Street, uh, that hasn't happened as much, but I think that's more uh, due to the pattern of individual property ownership and um, uh, the difficulty of assembling a, a block of properties that uh, would make sense to develop, uh, uh, redevelop on that scale. I'm not seeing any other comments, so I really appreciate what staff's brought, brought forward to us here. Uh, with regards to this, is a very exciting topic for me, and I think everybody else here. Thank you. And, um, oh yes, and at this point in time, I'll hand it uh, over to uh, Carrie Westbrook. Okay, thanks everyone for your participation tonight, um, both both the Landmarks Preservation Board and uh, Planning Commission. Um, 
So wrapping up, um, we do want to make sure we've uh, I'll, I'll let everyone make comments from individual board and commission members on, members on anything in the uh, the shared agenda tonight. If I'm to understand that this is a shared agenda, correct? That prior to the planning commission me commission meeting, which will continue on. So if you didn't get uh, a comment in from some t subject tonight or something that relates to this, uh, now would be the time. I don't see anyone. <laughs> How about any staff, Sarah, Dave, Mike? No? Just really appreciate everybody uh, coming out tonight. Uh, I think it's been a, a good discussion. Um, always interested in, in these joint uh, board and commission meetings as we've talked with uh, both chairs. Uh, you know, when we have a, a, a purpose, a good reason for, for doing that, we think these are very, very helpful. So if there's a particular agenda item where it makes sense, we'll be looking at these opportunities in the future as well. Yeah, it's useful, and it, it, since I'm still just finishing my second year, for me it's really important to see how the places we do overlap and have distinctions and how we fit into the, the landmark fits into the the overall uh, Bothell Municipal Code and, and where we do need to be talking to planning and, and vice versa. So it's informative. Thanks. Uh, next steps um, for us, for Landmark Preservation Board, um, we will make a recommendation to council after our November 26th meeting regarding the um, uh, Title 22 changes that we discussed tonight. And um, historic resources, like Sarah said, you're going to wrap that up very soon. And it sounds like share it with everyone, get it out there. Um, otherwise, um, we're going to go into a break. I believe and there's some other business I'm supposed to do. First of all, Landmark Board uh, will be adjourning and Planning Commission will be continuing their meeting for the evening. So, uh, and point of order, do I need to do a, um, a vote or what we, will we, uh, we agree to adjourn? Technically, you don't have a quorum, so. Oh my gosh, of course. So I could, I could um, just say. So I think you can just adjourn. Okay. All right, Landmark is adjourning. There's gonna be a break and Planning Commission continues on. Thank In you. about five minutes? Five minute break, Great. enough? And we'll okay. reconfigure the tables, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks.
Okay, we are back um, from our break. And so we'll now move into the study session. Uh, we'll be led by Bruce Blackburn, senior planner, and we'll be talking about the Canyon Park sub area update. Thank you, you thank for you. being here, Bruce. Thank you. I'm going to use the podium because it's a little easier, I think. Yes, I know. We have all this, well, I know, we have all this wonderful technology that I kind of refuse to use. So. Yes, eventually we will, yeah, go ahead and start that process. Why not? We'll get everybody going on there. Um, this is a briefing on Canyon Park. I've been doing these periodically to keep everybody up to speed on what we're doing out there. A lot of action going on. Tonight, there's no action requested of the commission. This is a staff briefing and update. Uh, we're gonna do a little presentation here. You're gonna get some maps you get to look at, take one of each of those piles. And we're hoping that we get a few questions from the commission, some ideas that you may have, or some comments you might generate as we help to kind of develop the next process here beyond the environmental impact statement. Now in a few weeks, we're gonna be issuing a plan action draft environmental impact statement. And there's gonna be a 45 day comment period on this uh, provision. One of the things we're gonna do, we're gonna give folks a little extra time because of the holidays. We recognize that's a tough thing to do in those time frames. There's a couple of advantages to a planned action EIS, and that's basically what we did in our downtown area. And it allows a more comprehensive analysis of the impacts expected by, for the development. It also allows future development to rely upon that environmental anal analysis so they can go through a shorter time frame for review aspect. I, they don't have to do their own full environmental review. One of the things we're gonna be doing here in the next 45 days is we're gonna be really implementing a really aggressive public outreach strategy. And we got a lot of folks we're gonna be contacting. We also have a lot of different methods that we're gonna use. We're gonna use some face-to-face -face meetings, social media, open houses, web page communication, public meetings. We're gonna really try and do a lot to get people aware of this exciting opportunity. Even though it's kind of late at night, it's not so exciting right now. Um, our audience, of course, is the property owners, businesses, that's a real key port, employees, as well as residents and neighborhoods who surround this area. That's a really key focus we wanna do. And one of the things that I kinda of like to also identify is kinda of let people know what an environmental impact statement is. It's something that we don't do a lot of, and essentially what it is, it's an assessment of potential impacts. Now this draft planned action EIS is gonna have seven elements that it focuses on. Natural environment, land use patterns, which is really important within, within this particular area. Aesthetics, urban design, social economics. We wanna talk about those, some of those items that, that uh, are really important to this community. We also wanna talk about transportation and greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation in particular is gonna be a real key focus of this uh, uh, process. Public services, you know, police, fire, schools, things of that nature. Utilities and stormwater, particularly stormwater. Uh, again, this is an area that's got a lot of natural features. We wanna make sure our stormwater provisions are very strong and robust. The, yes. Sorry. Uh, kind of interesting to me that we're combining transportation and greenhouse gas emissions. Now I recognize transportation is probably the largest contributor but there are also a lot of uh, development uh, activities which contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and even you know, conservation, land use elements have uh, greenhouse yes. gas emissions. So and, and I probably should have done a little bit different on this slide. It's transportation, greenhouse gas emissions. I kind of grouping them together because that's what usually people kind of associate them, but you're absolutely right. Uh, there are quite a few other elements that involve greenhouse gas, I mean, particularly how efficient your buildings are. That's a real key right there. Yes. So uh, that's a good point. I'll make sure and uh, key that in as we do our DIS uh, work. Thank you. Um, one of the things about this uh, draft environmental impacts, I mean, is that this is a complexity of Canyon Park. We have a lot of different land uses. We have a really strong economic engine, a lot of activity going out there. Natural environment is a very huge component of this area. Uh, this, you see a lot of green up there. A lot of those are uh, critical areas and uh, buffers and things of that nature. Transportation system is gonna be the key. Uh, I'm gonna get a, bit, a little bit more into that in a few moments, but transportation improvements is also gonna be really important. We're gonna have to come up with some way to get people moving within that area. We have some outside influences, Puget Sound Regional Councils, uh, Regional Growth Center minimum capacities. There are certain minimum standards 
and what they call activity units that we have to meet to retain that RGC, is what it's called, um, a designation. Washington State Department of Transportation has a major project here. We're extending the, they are extending the express toll lanes, the two lanes of express toll lanes up to SR 527 and doing a on off ramp from those express toll lanes directly into the park. So that's a really important element. We also have a proposed sound transit bus space facility that is looking at this area. Um, that has an impact on our ability to meet our growth targets underneath the RGC provision. As well as, you know, there's some heavy duty tra transportation in that area. Finally, and this is by no means the least, uh, we've got some private streets out there. And one of the features of that is that there's some very unique aspects of those private roadways that make it a little bit challenging if we want to do some future improvements internally to the park. And one of the provisions we want to talk about, we are talking to the owners of that uh, business park about that potential of transferring those into a public ownership. That may happen in a phase provision, more than likely something like that. Uh, but that's going to be a really important topic of discussion. Um, so what's in the EIS? We have basically some alternatives. And these are basically just things we can analyze to understand what the different levels of impact are. Certainly the first one is no action alternative. And that basically means you allow what you have now, our current comp plan and regulations, to develop as they would in the next 20 years and see where that gets you. And, you know, that basically identifies about a, a regional growth center right now in the city of Bothell is 733 acres in size. Right now, our planned capacities don't meet the regional growth center uh, minimum framework of 85 activity units per acre. We don't meet there in our uh, current plan. We have about 12,600 existing activity units in this area. That's a lot. I mean, that's mostly employees, but there's also some residential. But that's a lot of people out there already using this, this area. The current plan, we can only get to about 30. And right now, we've got about 17 to 18 activity units per acre in existing configuration. So again, you can see we have a lot of folks out there already. One of the alternatives we'd be looking at, and we've kind of had a little discussion about this, is a live-work alternative. And this would apply kind of quite a bit of mixed-use residential to the area, about you know, and the mixture would be about 32% population and 68% employment. This is an area that's a little bit smaller in the RGC. It's gone down to 613 acres. Now, that's an important fact because the Puget Sound Regional Council gives us quite a range on the size of the RGC, anywhere from 200 acres up to 640 acres. So this gets us within that RGC criteria. Our current RGC is just a little bit larger than what they would prefer. But you can see this basically identifies an area where we have a lot of redevelopment mixed use with residential offices that are along the main spine, if you would, the Buffalo River Highway area, as well as some of the areas that are southwest of the Interstate 405 area. So this is kind of an interesting area. One of the things you'll see on the maps is there's some circles. And those are circles basically distance from transit facilities, transit you know, centers. And that's an important configuration because we want to make sure we do things that can accommodate and take advantage of those new facilities we're getting, receiving. The other uh, d uh, alternative being looked at is what's called Business Plus. And this is a more business-focused provision. Yes, please. Very, very quick clarification. What's the radius of those circles? Oh, I'm sorry. One quarter acre, I'm sorry, one quarter mile and one half mile. Thank you. You bet. Um, Business Plus is a little bit more focused along an employment aspect. You can see the population is about 20%, employment is about 8%. You can see the much significantly larger area is devoted to the, the business type of a uh, focus. You know, you, if you compare the two, you can see there are quite a bit, few more areas in there. Um, we also have some higher density mixed use that are kind of around the area to the south and to the north. Um, we were kind of looking at those as logical locations for more like transit-oriented development or something like that. This, pro this uh, alternative is, is pretty interesting from the standpoint it really does achieve the, the desire. Some of the folks identified when we did this, the envisioning was, okay, make this a business-centric uh, area. Uh, I need to talk a little bit about transportation. You folks have already seen this, but it bears repeating. Um, you know, you can see what the conditions are in 2014 that are not any better today. And you can see what we're looking at in 2043 under a no action. If we do nothing, this 
corridor of the 527 Bothell Everett Highway gets very close to our maximum, well, it actually does achieve our maximum acceptable uh, corridor level of service. And you can see a lot of the intersections, the circles, have got Fs on them. That means they are failing intersections. Uh, this is up and down this area. We are very close, 2043, to get into that, um, uh, that, that failure provision for that corridor. This is if we do nothing. So, you know, doing nothing doesn't get us out of the issue of, of having in transportation situations. One of the things that's interesting about this 2045 when the uh, traffic transportation modeling was done is that they actually did include the projects that we currently have in our comp plan to get those implemented. So this shows you how, how tough it's gonna be to solve the transportation issue out there. Bruce? Yes. Really quickly. Um, so what does it take to get an F? Like, I mean, what, what does that entail? I mean. It's a second delay. How many seconds you have to do to wait there? And there's a range. Uh, you know, from very low, okay, hey, you home, hardly have to spend any time there to a long, lot of seconds. And they range anywhere from, you know, zero to 60. Much above 60 is considered, I think it's 60 to 80 is considered an F. Maybe somebody can correct me because I can't remember the act numbers. Um, but we are well into those numbers up there. Yeah, just, just uh, sorry to, I didn't mean to interrupt too much, but there's like the E at the very top and the northwest section you go from 17.6 to 31,000 and it's still e level that would seem like that wouldn't that's in a way it's ah and that's where oh. the projects that are being proposed kind of help some of those numbers so yeah it doesn't get all the way there but it really does kind of show you even with those big projects that we've got planned uh we still have some transportation issues we have to resolve and i just want to elaborate on some things that that bruce has said you were just touching on Bruce, the, the projects that are this. It's not really, it's not really a do nothing um, alternative. It's a no action alternative, meaning we continue on with what's already in the plan. We do, there are still several transportation improvement projects that are on the, the, the plan that would get put in place, on, assuming those get put in place, which is what the assumption is for our, our current comprehensive plan for this area. So I just wanna clarify that it's, it's not that we leave it totally on its own. There are already plans and improvements for that area, and we already have a land use plan for that area, so the no action just means we don't change anything. We do nothing to change the current plan is what, what Bruce means by that. Yeah, the, the other The other thing I wanna clarify is that F rating is not necessarily failing, although that's the generally accepted definition of that. Um, as a planner, I, take, I, I approach that a little bit differently because under growth management, you can set a level of service at any level you want to. So we could have A through Z, and failing is not necessarily a definition of any of those. It just means this is the level of service we're willing to live with. So I think that's an important distinction to keep in mind as well. ARCS currently goes A through F. So the logical comparison is to what, you know, what we're used to in school when you get a grade, F is failing. And under our current definition, if that's the worst we would accept, then yes, that could be considered failing. But there are a lot of different ways to measure that. So I just want to make sure the, the, that the commission um, understands that as well. And, and does the city have a, uh, a goal for a level of service when a new project is designed, for instance? What, is there a target you're shooting for? Yes, our corridor level of service is E. That is the corridor level service we want to achieve and that we have established within our comprehensive plan. So if a project is proposed and it is going to lower that level of service and the traffic studies indicate to us what an impact that is, then they have to provide mitigation that at least maintains the, the current level of service or somehow addresses it. Or we agree to live with a lower level of service. Thank you. Yes. Um, one other quick question. This corridor is affected, I think, greatly by the development up off 180th. Like the north part of Bothell, there's been an expansive growth in residential development. Um, do these projections take into account kind of the cut through traffic going to those areas as a projection of 2043? Yes, what, what, what the traffic model does is they take those, that background traffic and they add it to the numbers. So. Essentially what this is, this is trying to capture what we are expecting 
to have for our growth. And they base it on a couple of different factors. One is Puget Sound Regional Council actually has some, some growth factors they apply and would like to, they, they demand that it be put into traffic model. So this would assume that we continue with that development up north as well as within the city of Bothell through that, those years. Okay, and do you guys ever work together on what those figures will be? Like I'm, I'm assuming that probably the growth projections in the last 10 years were exceeded by actual development because I mean, who could have predicted that it would have all hit at this one time? I'm just wondering if you guys have a more long range or kind of from a development side, the areas that will next be uh, turned over. That's an interesting aspect because right now, uh, I have been embroiled within some buildable lands analysis that we're doing with the Snohomish County and King County. And one of the real challenges that we have identified as a group is that how are we going to predict what is really happening out there because our past predictions anticipate a certain amount of, of capacity and a certain amount of growth and it's happened much faster than that would have would have been expected to occur. Not necessarily beyond what was allowed, certainly. I mean, it was planned for that, but it's just happened in a very compressed time frame. So, uh, and that's one of the things that we're trying to identify, particularly for Snohomish County, uh, which the Southwest Snohomish County area has just seen a huge amount of growth that was just really, uh, it's just uh, almo almost un, uh, well, I won't say underestimated, but um, uh, it, it was not predicted, certainly. A couple of questions, sorry. I was gonna save my last one, but I'll start with this one, if, if you don't mind. The numbers on there, and I think I know the answer to this, but those are vehicle trips, or are those people moved through the corridor? Ah, uh, those are vehicle trips. Do you measure people moved through the corridor as well? We are trying to do that with this process. It's really interesting because as you start throwing the transit element into play, uh, and we have just a little while with the BRT green line, to kind of help establish that. So it's been kind of a difficult thing. We're trying to get a handle. We actually had a meeting last week with community transit. So, okay, what are you guys seeing for your growths? And they're gonna give us some updated information on it. But yeah, this is vehicles travel. Okay, thank you. And then my second question about transportation methodology is with respect to the circles in the quarter mile and half mile radius, is that exactly how you're studying it is just the gross distance, or are you measuring the walk shed? We're trying to use a walk shed. In fact, one of the things that we were fortunate to have last year, we had an intern who did some walk shed maps. And I said, okay, how long does it take me to get from the park and ride to this location? And we're trying to do that as well. This is kind of a, a kind of a quickie version of that, just kind of showing that quarter mile and half mile so people get an idea of what that is. But in some situations, the quarter mile happens really fast fast, i.e. you don't get very far from that park and ride because you can't actually walk some of those areas. So Especially in this development. It, particularly area. in this development yep. where we, we have some serious gaps in pedestrian activity. So yeah, that's one of the elements that we're really trying to get a handle on in, as we do this. We're, we're really using those as a proxy okay. for the five and 10 minute walk sheds. So yeah. it's, it's really not about distance, it's about walk time okay. and, and walk yes. conditions. Um, but typically, you know, for uh, at this level, uh, uh, an initial level of conceptualization, we use those as a proxy for a five and 10 minute walk. So five minute walk, I know you know this, this for the for the benefit of the record or anybody else that may pay attention to this, the five minute walk is really uh, what the typical walk is for someone uh, going to bus stop uh, for a, a more of the a high capacity transit, which in our case would be the BRT. Um, they generally, uh, generally accept it as about a 10 minute walk. That's actually increasing, I think, according to the studies, uh, particularly for things like light rail, they'll actually walk more than 10 minutes. But again, that also depends on the walking condition. So if you have good sidewalks, it's safe, it's well lit, it's, you know, there are lots of interesting things along the way, um, then it's, you're more likely to get the pedestrian uh, in that, within that walk shed. If it's, if it's dark, it's discontinuous sidewalks. You may be within the quarter mile, but people aren't going to walk there. So there are a lot more factors that go into it. That's why these are really just a crude proxy for those five and 10 minute walks. So for the purpose of the DEIS, are you using a more sophisticated methodology to analyze that? Or are you just using the circles and which properties are within a quarter and a half? Again, at the level we're at now, we're doing the circles. Okay. Because if we started getting into that really detailed information, we'd get really embroiled with details. And but it would be more fun. Might be able to get it. But yeah, they are more fun. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, right now we're kind of using the broad five and ten minute, you know, quarter mile, half mile measurement tool. But yeah, you're right. Eventually, we're going to have to get really detailed on that. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Good questions. I like it. Can I ask one more? I don't want to belabor this slide to death, but um, I, my own opinion has always been that we're kind of constrained geographically in Bothell, and this is sort of our last horizon as far as best opportunity for transit-oriented development. It's obviously not ideal, but you're close to 405, close to I-5. You have some options, none of them great. Um, do you know of any long-term plans on the other major north-south corridors? I-5, probably not, but like Highway 9, do you know if there's any expansion to help relieve some of the congestion in here over the next 20 years, or do you think that 527 is going to maintain sort of the overfill, everyone sort of directs to the middle route um, moving forward? Well, uh, now are you talking transit or are you talking about general tran transfer? Transportation, like an expansion okay. of Highway 9 to add a third lane each way or, you know, widening at Snohomish where it breaks down to one, one lane for a short amount of time. Yeah. We haven't gone into the detail of what those far-ranging kind of projects are going to involve. Our issue is geography, and our geography is we have a lot of activity going up just north of this area. And the Bothell Everett Highway is the main corridor to get there. And that's where, that's why this corridor is so heavily transferred, traveled. If we had another, well, I'll throw this out, another um, uh, off ramp up there by maybe a little bit further north, we could do some of those alternatives. Those are really super long range plans that are probably beyond the our current planning horizon of 2043 that we're looking at. Um, so it's it's tough to say, oh, okay, well, we're going to do this project on I-5 and it's going to take care of us. We still have this geographic situation we have to uh, consider. So we are looking at some future improvements. So, for example, the express toll lanes on I-405 uh, factors into the transportation analysis going forward. Yes, it does. Um, as far as things like Highway 9, I, I, I don't recall. Uh, we did have a, a the TAC group, the transportation group that yes. included Snohomish County, WashDOT. Um, so if there were any particular plans, I think, you know, that probably would have come out through that process. Highway 9 in particular is a bit of a double-edged sword because there's already a study that's been done by Snohomish County about expanding the, the UGA to the southwest. But essentially, it, in essence, it would create a city larger than Bothell, just to our east in the rural area. And Highway 9 is the spine for that. So if they improve the roadway, there'll be more pressure to increase the development in that area. That if you increase sense. the development in that area, we're going to see more traffic coming through this area as well. So gotcha. it's induced demand, right? Yeah. A lot, well, yeah. Um, one of the things that we can identify is that we do have, of course, the Swift Green Line, which is coming up and down the five. 27 corridor in which uh, I've rode a little bit, but I want to explore it on more of a, a more a typical commute day. I did it on a weekend, but it's kind of a cool thing. I, I really kind of like it. It's it's going to help a lot. So you, we kind of talked a little bit about some of the local things we can do. And one of the items that we have identified is that we are going to have to do something to distribute the traffic just off of 527 or the Bothell Everett Highway. We got to get them toward 9th and we got to get them toward 524, which is a basically an east-west corridor. It'd be great to get them onto 228th Street as well. So these are some areas that we have identified. If there's a way to make a connection, it makes a lot of sense to do that. Um, one of the other elements we're looking at, we're looking at a lot of improvements to some of our intersections. You know, we're doing some double lane lefts and some more rights and adding whatever we can within those intersections. They can only get so big. And we're getting pretty close to as big as they can get, particularly the 527, 524 intersection. So that's one of the elements that we're starting to run up against is just the physical limitation of a 2D or a two-dimensional type of a, a situation. And this is one of the items that we're going to have in the draft environmental impact statement. We're actually going to look at a couple of these connections out toward 9th to the north, as well as improving 228th Street so it can accommodate more. Each, one, each of these have got individual impacts that we need to have a, a lot of discussion with our neighbors, the neighbors in the area. We need to have an understanding of what the impacts are for, from an environmental aspect. Um, you know, but, you know, going out through 214th, 
a street, uh, gets you people out of the RGC, but puts them on the 9th Avenue. So what does that do to the 9th Avenue? Well, that means 9th Avenue has to be improved, and that's basically what this is talking about, is making that into a real true collector road. Um, and of course, you know, there's a lot of residential and some schools on that area, as well as improving uh, 524, the Maltby, Maltby Road, again, toward the west to get people more moving back and forth. So uh, this is something that we have identified as a needing to have some uh, understanding in the EIS. You'll see quite a bit of discussion about this. Uh, these are, this is a, this is tough stuff. Um, it's not easy to look at this and say, okay, how are we gonna make this economic engine, which is so phenomenal and does so many good things for the community, function well uh, in this transportation system. So um, a lot of more discussions we will be having uh, and uh, you know, a very challenging aspect, but yeah, it's one of the things we're gonna be looking at. Um, and we're adding lanes as much as we can you know, within reason, but it gets really tough to continue to make them bigger and bigger. Um, and we aren't going to the three-dimensional you know, overflies and things like that. Those are just hugely expensive. So this will be a fun discussion. Yes. We're also looking at increasing uh, park and ride capacity. I know the facilities are right now. Over no capacity. Um, and you know that's one of the that's one of the really tough things. Okay, do you increase the park and ride capacity to have people more people drive there, or do you have that park and ride facility act more as a transit center? Um, the, the, the transit agencies are saying, look, we're getting some pretty significant increases in our daily boardings in this location. Uh, we're seeing some really much larger numbers than we have ever seen before. And that's one of the things we're asking CT to provide us. Okay, what is the real number here? Um, so yeah, it's, that's, that's one of the things that we're trying to do. But the expansion of the park and ride is going to be a really tough, tough nut right now. And it's right now, it's not in anybody's plan. Of course, it's a wash dock facility. So it'd have to be within their uh, 405, and it's not in their 405 uh, um, master plan right now. Well, there's a lot of single family homes that are well outside the half mile or 10 minute radius. And if you're going to get those people on mass transit, you got to get them to those stops. Yes, you're right. And that's, I mean, we've got this, you know, it's that first last mile. We keep talking about that, but even, even more, more like first and last five miles. But uh, yeah, it's it's a real challenge to get people from those facilities into a decent park and ride. And, and park and ride lots are tough. And one of the things that you're going to see a little bit of discussion in the EIS is about is some of the other park and ride lots that are going to be looked at and expanded. But um, there's a lot of there's a lot of activity around that going on right now. And, and we'll probably give you a little bit more briefing on that as we get into this uh, process. Does um, the bike master plan that is in development play into this transportation facet at all? One of the real keys that we're going to be looking at is what we call transportation demand management. And that's a multiple, you know, uh, strategy that has uh, all kinds of different things. We're going to be talking about to the employers about, okay, let's do some telework. Let people take time and, and work from home. Let's do some mode shifts. Okay, when people are going to be riding their bikes and maybe sub, you know, some, some transit pass uh, subsidies and things like that. Bikes and that other form of transportation is going to definitely have to be it. Uh, we have a really great opportunity here because we have the North Creek Trail. And it has continued to expand to the north end. Of course, you can get all the way down to the south. So that's a really a great facility that we have that we can take advantage of. We have to do more improvements on bike facilities, however. Um, and there's just no doubt about that. We have to do better about inserting some of those bike lanes where we think people are going to use them, particularly along 17th Avenue Southeast, which connects the business park to that park and ride, that transit center area, um, which is right. Uh, well, you can see where the little number one is. Um, that basically, that, oh, thank you. This is cool. You are. Uh, one of the things that is happening with this um, ST, um, I'm sorry, not ST, uh, Wash Dot uh, ETL off ramp is an improvement to 17th Avenue and includes bike lanes. Protected bike lanes? Unfortunately, not protected, but 
we're trying to come up with as much as we can in a separated situation, yes. I would want to reiterate that paint isn't bike infrastructure, and so separation is critical yes. in any capacity, even extruded curbs, um, in order to get a higher usage of those those facilities for people of all yeah. abilities. And, and the preliminary design has some separation to it. It's not all just on the road. So, so there is as much as we possibly can. And one of the things that we've done is we've been doing a lot of discussion with Washington, okay, what side of the road should we enhance for bikes? What side should we do this? And so it's a kind of an interesting um, design that has been formatted. I should, I, have to, I should bring that to you guys so you can take a look at that and see what, what has been identified as the best way to do this, again, within a limited right-of-way, or not a right-of-way, a right, limited area we have. So, uh, But certainly some protection is absolutely necessary. I appreciate um, getting a chance to take a look at those because I have this fear that a lot of money will be spent on bike infrastructure, and if it's not done properly the first time, we're going to end up with um, low-quality infrastructure for the rest of my lifetime, and, and that's not something I want to see. Well, actually, you know, I think that's a good point, and... Um, uh, when we get into the sub-area planning process, we're going to be talking about a lot about the internal connections within this area. And I think that let's keep thinking about that bike facility connections and making sure that is a really good system for this area. Keep that thought. So, oh, okay, go ahead. You got it. Oh, the other way. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I just want to comment on the temporal shifts and the flexible work schedules going back to park and rides. If you're showing up after 7, 7.30, you're driving. 6.30. Yeah, depending on which, which location it is, yeah. So, you know, if you are shifting people, you're shift them, shifting them onto the road, not into transit, without the ability to get to those stops. Parks in place, yeah. I know, and that's, that's a challenge. Um, okay, good, good comment. Thank you. Re recognizing that that's a valid point, I will say that I park at the uh, the Bothell Park and Ride occasionally, and if I'm going to leave my house after seven thirty, I don't drive. I leave my car at home and I walk, and I'm over a mile. So it's not always shifting them to driving. Sometimes people just make a less convenient choice. So the next thing I want to talk a little bit about, we're going to talk a little bit about preferred alternatives. We're getting a little bit into this, not a lot, but a little bit. Um, one of the elements we've looked at, we've kind of talked about some of the acreages of the RDC. A provision within the draft EIS you're going to see is what's called a mitigated boundary. And essentially that is an even smaller RGC. And the primary difference there is a couple of things. When we take out, whoa, hold on. Ah, shoot, sorry. I hit the wrong button. Now I gotta get my glasses out. Make sure you're on the bottom. There it is right there, okay, thank you. Um, you'll see that there's a couple areas here that are wetlands that are being removed. And the boundary doesn't continue to extend into the Snohomish County area. Um, we had some conversations with the Puget Sound Regional Council staff on what type of a process that would require to do that. And that's one of those things that, you know what, that's something we want to do later because it's a really major process. So essentially what we do is we get down to about 535 acres, I'm sorry, 565 acres, and you can see the impact it has on our ex, uh, activity units. We go from a high of 20,000 down to about 12.8, as well as it has a major impact on the amount of PM peak hour trips generated from the area. 
So this is a really important mitigation factor that we are going to be, uh, we have quite a bit of discussion, we'll have quite a bit of discussion in the draft EIS about, and will help lead our discussion about a preferred alternative. And that's why it's important that I got the maps out there for you guys get, to folks to take a look at. And that's where this mitigated live work comes into play, and that's one of their maps out there. This basically kind of superimposes that new boundary, if you would, on the live work alternative and kind of shows you um, approximately what impacts it has. You know, we get to about a 60, 36%, 64% uh, shift because we've taken out a few of the areas here. So it's, it's again, pretty, pretty extensive for businesses, but we have a little bit more of the mixed use areas. Now, this is all subject to change. And one of the things that we'll be having more discussion about is what is the appropriate mix and what is this should be. This is just the thing that we, this is just one of the elements that we're environment, uh, in evaluating in the environmental review so that we can have a bookend. And if we're smaller, great. Uh, if we're a little bit bigger, okay, but not too much bigger. But the whole concept here is just to get you familiar with the fact that we do have some flexibility with the Puget Sound Regional Council's P, uh, RGC framework on the size of the area. And primarily what you're seeing here is we're removing lands that we couldn't build on anyway. And you know, the wetlands and buffers, really important features of this area, but we can't build on them anyway. Why would we want to have to make a, 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 a conscious choice of having those part of our uh, activity unit numbers? So this is kind of leading toward the concept of a, um, a preferred alternative. Bruce, um, I wanted to comment briefly on the changing boundaries of the um, area it just at, on a high level it looks or and it feels kind of like we're trying to gerrymander our way out of a uh, potential problems with um, activity units which that that is maybe useful in itself but I think that we do also have a responsibility as a city with a regional growth center to take on regional growth and so um, I, I would encourage um, when people start to evaluate these different options, instead of just looking for um, maybe the lowest, what I'm going to be doing at least, is instead of just looking for the, the least impactful um, changes in terms of um, maybe mitigation of uh, wetlands and un developable areas maybe looking to see um, what we get the best maybe bang for our buck um, instead of just trying to reduce the grade level down to a point that we can achieve you know that's a good point one of the things that we do have the flexibility here is that yeah 45 is activity units per acre is the minimum we can have it higher than that there's nothing wrong with saying look we're going to have a little capacity surplus if you would we want to make sure that that we do achieve that regional growth status and we want to make sure we can have a really great functioning synergetic you know mix of people and and businesses and employees and things of that nature and that's certainly one of the items that we can talk about as we get into the preferred alternative is what should be the number right okay and I appreciate the comment. I think that's an important point for us to keep in mind as mm -hmm. we're explaining this and conveying it because that is certainly part of the reason for that. We're, um, but there's more to it than that as well. Uh, and a couple of things to keep in mind is what we're eliminating are, are basically those areas that are undevelopable, that are counted against our, our AU tally. So we want to make sure that we're actually including areas that we can put development on in order to achieve that minimum of 45 that, that Bruce is talking about. The other piece of that is, as we talk about the land use and we talk about the levels of intensity here, we're making sure that we hit that 45 at least as a minimum. That's not to say that we couldn't increase the allowable intensity or development potential within even this reduced area so that we would have that additional capacity for more growth in the area. Uh, the, the third thing I would note is even if we just limited it to the 45 to make sure we meet that threshold, that's still more than a 100% increase over what we currently have there. So it, we're still accommodating a lot of growth in the future. 
Right. I'm. Thank you um, for the clarification. One of my concerns is just also from the regional council's position. Are they going to be making determinations for um, resource um, uh, spreading out? I don't know resource um, uh, determinations based on um, like what existing capacity is is there or is it just like when we include the Safeway in the North North Creek area then we're kind of making ourselves look a little bit better than than we are and maybe getting higher on lists for funding I'm I just don't maybe it's a marketing thing where it, it appears to be gerrymandering when it's really not but um, I guess that's I'm rambling so it, no I think your point is well taken yeah. and we we don't want to do anything that um, that is not going to pass the the sniff test with PSRC when we because we do have to take this to them uh, as we update the plan they'll need to, to approve it in terms of the changes to the regional growth center boundary as well so we want to make sure that we're presenting that in a way that really explains all of the reasons for that and that it's not just because you know we picked up 25 AUs that we we added this area um, as long as, as um, by the same token as long as we're meeting the criteria that they have I think they're a little more forgiving a little more flexible in terms of of how the boundaries actually come about if you look at most of the regional growth centers that have been designated and, and even including a couple that have recently been approved they're similar to this so it's part of how it works too thanks for that clarification yeah. sorry that's no that not perfect so I'm listening for more comments just here. gonna I'm just gonna make a, a question for the chair there's 15 minutes before the scheduled end of the meeting and I'm just wondering if we should do a time check and try to understand if we should try to push through this or if we're going to try to extend the meeting yeah I think we should try to push through this and not extend the meeting unless uh, how much time do you think you have we're, left? I've got a lot more input here than oh you do okay. yeah so keep okay. at it <laughs> no but as we, far as uh, I don't have very much more to present hardly any, much, hardly anything at all just a little bit about some of the upcoming schedule we're going to do so what do we I support pushing through I just want to make sure that we're going to get yeah. I mean this is really good work that you're doing so I don't want to cut you off if yeah Okay, right, I think we're, yeah, great. So, good comments. I just want to let you know that about a little bit about the schedule, and that's really the last thing I wanted to kind of leave you with. Uh, you know, we're going to have some continued discussions about the preferred alternative. The month of November, which is almost gone in December, is going to be heavy in the public engagement, as well as the issuance of the draft uh, environmental impact statement. That's a huge um, milestone for us. In January, February, and March, we're going to get really into the preferred alternative. We're going to really talk a lot about this, and we're going to get, get into some of these details that we've identified, um, as well as have some of the preliminary sub-area plan and implementing regulation changes that we're going to be going along with that preferred alternative. So January, March, and January through March is a pretty heavy lift. April, May, and June is a really serious help because then we're going to actually come up with the subarea plan and, and issue the final environmental impact statement and then in July ish we're going to have the council adopt this so um, it's going to get pretty intense here in, in the next few months but also very interesting because we're going to delve into some of these items that you've had to actually talked about this evening I would just highlight for the Commission the, if you can go back to the slide, Bruce, the, the things that were highlighted in red, that was for the, the, the uh, City Council, but those are also Planning Commission uh, benchmarks as well in this process. So the, the Commission will be making a recommendation on a preferred alternative to the Council. That will be in the first quarter. Uh, we're still trying to pin down an exact date, but that's either going to be late January, early February when, when that will be coming to you for a recommendation on a preferred alternative. That's why we want to spend some time with you going over this information. And then likewise, obviously, you'll be heavily involved in the recommendation on the sub-area plan itself and the regulations that go with that. Quick question. I'm blanking on the name, but is the consultant still involved? Yes. In fact, this is probably the last meeting you'll have just me. Um, the consultant will basically be 
coming in and providing you a lot more detail on that stuff. In fact, we'll probably have one, well, I, I'm trying to think back at the schedule, but they will definitely spend some time with the Planning Commission on some of these items. Okay, and I don't think we're missing anything. I wasn't trying to infer that you no, know, no, we're yeah, lacking but... at all. Um, I was just curious, were there process and kind of who hands off the baton when we're looking for public feedback and certain elements of the schedule? Is it Are you guys dividing it up or is a lot of it fall into their court? Uh, well, uh, it's everything. Uh, the consultant is, they are so key to the public engagement because they have the really detailed answers that sometimes we get requested for. As well as, of course, we're going to be there also to help with the public uh, policy aspect. Okay, that's one of our strengths. So we're going to be a definitely, a definitely be a team effort as we go forward. Okay, great. And I think we've got a lot of incredible public feedback already early in the process that you we guys have. got through surveys and through meeting with individual groups. What I'm hoping to is we can, what I'm hoping that we can do is really memorialize what our findings are like we did the first time around because like our meeting last, our last meeting, you know, there were discussions about what were priorities for the area that maybe didn't fall in line with the large amount of feedback we got, you know, across the body. So it'd be nice to go back and just say, this is what we're targeting based on everything we've heard and kind of have that be our driving mission statement as how we pull Canyon Park together. Yeah. In fact, one of the things that's really kind of interesting is, I mean, we started this process in 2007, 20, 2017 and spent a lot of time on that vision aspect and we got some great feedback as well as when we started the next phase, which is the more of the technical, we kind of reiterated, okay, Here's some of the things we heard. What are you thinking? And we got a lot more good feedback, and we think that we will continue to get that good feedback. What we're doing now is that now we have some pretty specific um, elements for folks to comment on, and that's one of the things I think that's going to be one of the things that's kind of interesting because we're actually going to talk about, well, what about this kind of a building height? What about this kind of a building appearance? So those are things that are going to be really uh, important as we get into the more of the detailed kind of items. Well, thank you, Bruce. I don't see any other comments right now from anybody. Okay. So you guys know where I am, so just let me know if you have questions <laughs> or anything like that. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. That's really great. It just gets, yeah. Thank you for providing us the pictures and, and all those options. And that was good comments from all the commission on, on things to look at with regards to the big picture and what we're trying to do. Yeah. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll entertain an approval of the minutes. One comment on the minutes. Um, at the meeting, when I recused myself, it, it mentioned that, but it didn't mention that I left and that I wasn't there for the remainder of the meeting, and I don't know if that's necessary or not. That, that should be in there. In fact, I thought that was something I saw. I thought I fixed that because it, the earlier draft I saw, it had you, it had the chair opening the public hearing and then you recusing yourself and I thought it right. happened in and the I'm other reading that he recused order. himself but not didn't uh, didn't leave okay so we will oh there it is okay so you just want to say that you had left that basically I mean the there meeting. were other items besides that public hearing so I think it's important to note that I wasn't there I mean if we're I, keeping I think records we should keep good records I, I agree we we can make that change All with right. the with the commission's approval. We can make that change. Sounds good. So, so you want a motion to approve as amended? <laughs> yeah, I move to approve as amended. Second. All those in favor of approving the minutes as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion to carries uh, carries unanimously. Unanimously. <clears throat> uh, no old business. I don't think Michael. Uh, reports from staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good meeting tonight, the, the joint session. Thank you very much for uh, all your participation in that uh, and for all your feedback on the, the Canyon Park presentation. You're going to see on your calendar as we're staff, uh, we've been working on putting together the calendar for 2020 and the docket, and you're going to see a lot of Canyon Park on your schedule over the next six months. So just be prepared for that. Um, we're going to really need a lot of a lot of your uh, time and effort on that, so we appreciate that in advance. Um, 
in terms of December, we have the two meetings. Uh, December 4th is your next meeting, and we have the downtown public hearing continuation on the public open downtown public open space amendments. Uh, we're also going to have a briefing on the traffic impact fees. That's coming up at council on December 3rd. Under the code amendments, the transportation, anything in the transportation code is supposed to come to the Planning Commission, but this isn't something that's really within your wheelhouse, so we're going to do a briefing, but there's really no action or, or role for the Commission in making a recommendation on what those traffic impact fees should be. So that's something we're going to work on clearing up in the, in the code, but we are going to have a briefing for you on that. And then uh, we're also uh, going to do a study session, an initial study session on the 2020 planning docket. So we'll bring that list to you and start to get your input on that. Uh, and then I think the plan at this point is to bring that back to you. Uh, we didn't do a recommendation last year, but we want to make sure that you have some time to provide some input that we can then share with the council because we're planning on taking that to them in either late January, or early February. So that's for the 4th. For the 18th, uh, we have a public hearing on the Downtown Historic Resources Code Amendments that you received the briefing on this evening from Dave Boyd. And then also a study session on the parks, uh, the, the PROS plan, Parks, Recreation, and Open Space plan uh, from Tracy Perkoski of the Parks Department. Uh, mm -hmm. And she'll be, that's a briefing, but I think she'll also be looking for input from, uh, from the Planning Commission at that point as well. So that's, that's another one that gets back to some of the amendments that were made in the, the housekeeping this last time around, where the Parks Board will make a recommendation to the Council um, on, the, on that plan, but any amendments to the comprehensive plan will come from the Planning Commission. So there will probably be some amendments that will be part of that 2020 docket related to the plan that, that you'll be seeing as well. So those are the two meetings in December uh, that we had scheduled. And then January, we have a little bit of a dilemma. We talked uh, uh, briefly about this last time. The first Wednesday is January 1st. So assuming nobody wants to meet on a day when City Hall is closed anyway, and there are a lot of good football games on that day, so we don't want to interfere with that. Um, so we are proposing that, uh, that we have the commission actually go to the second and fourth Wednesdays just for that month. And it actually works out pretty well because there is an extra Wednesday in January. So we still get a break before the first meeting in February. So if you're all okay with that, we would like to propose that we have the January 8th and 22nd dates for your meetings in January. What were those two dates again, the 8th and? 8th and 22nd. 22nd. So it would okay. be the second and fourth Wednesday just for that month. I really have been trying to keep us on the regular schedule of the first and third, but of course, Best laid plans. Do any commissioners know if they're not definitely going to be here? They on the, they have conflicts on those dates. I do not. Okay. January eighth and twenty second. Yeah, in twenty twenty. Yes. New year. And so far, I haven't. The, no one has given me anything for twenty twenty as far as absences. I have a conflict in the twenty second. Okay. So that puts us at five people. Yes. Without knowing uh, whether uh, Commissioner Pystrup can be there. Right. But that would give us four if if the rest of you can be there. So we'd be we'd be good. Yeah. Okay. So just don't get sick. Don't take vacations. Don't have last minute things come up. So. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So we will plan Great. then Thank on the you. on the eighth and the twenty second. So That's for good. the eighth of January, we're looking at the downtown public space recommendation. Uh, so you will have had the public hearing in December, and then we're hoping to get to a recommendation there. Another briefing on Canyon Park and the project schedule. This is really setting up for the the next meeting, which would be a preferred alternative. Uh, and then we'd bring the docket back to you on the eighth just to get your final comments on that. So then for the twenty second, we'd have the uh, Canyon Park preferred alternative recommendation. So that's your first major milestone in terms of recommendations to the, the council on Canyon Park. And then um, the downtown historic resources code amendments. So we've got, again, pretty full schedule for that, but that's what we're looking at. So thank you for confirming those dates for January. We'll move forward uh, on that schedule. Great. Uh, also had a question from Commissioner Kurd um, after the attendance at the 
of the conference, um, you received some information about membership in the American Planning Association, APA. Uh, so there are membership, um, uh, there's a membership level for planning commissioners. Uh, and I would, if you're interested, I would certainly encourage, uh, you know, if you want to be a part of that, we can sign you up. Uh, there's basic, there's a base rate and then there's a per person rate to do that. So I would need to know which of you would want to, to be signed up as members for that. And the, and the city would pay for that. We can use uh, okay, some so of our budget for that. Go ahead and that. email you if there are people are interested. Okay. Yep. Please right. email me if you, if you want to do that. And if you could do that, say in the next couple of weeks, you know, it's, we can sign you up any time, but I don't want this to, to drag on too long. So if we can get back to me in the next couple of weeks, and maybe I'll do a reminder at the next meeting or yeah, something. Or email, yeah. Okay. Good. That's uh, all I had. Thank you. Uh, not really any time for member reports. Anything have anything they have to say? We have Okay. Okay. A motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you all very much.